my show and the exhibition that I set up here. Um, I think the reason that I'm so delighted that we've all come together is I think it's a critical, it's, it, it's going to be the critical mass um, that, um, that, that pushes some of these concepts into um, it, into society and into into a more mainstream, which is personally what I'm keen on. I'm keen on some of these concepts and conversations arriving as 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 a broader conversation. Um, that's I think that's important. And um, from from the um, from my my analysis of of observing this type of content that uh, Georgina, Georgiana Houghton started to try and instigate a psychic uh, a, a psychic understanding 170 years ago um, and that's why you get the London College of Psychic Studies, which is quite a different beast from when it was set up. And so people have been trying what we're interested and fascinated by to do for, for all that time. But I do think it's, I think it's in the hands of the artists to actually turn that and make that happen because I feel that um, notions start in art and move across into other disciplines. Um, I personally feel that when I spoke, speak to scientists, I mean, they are literally um, 50 years behind art in, in their thinking, um, just starting to, 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 to consider a sort of postmodern type uh, conceptualization in science. So anyway, I'm gabbling on far too much. Um, I'm going to pass over and uh, uh, pass you over to Calvin. And I'm going to turn this oh, really? around. Yeah. I'm introducing myself now. Okay, <laughs> okay, will do. Um, my name's Calvin McLaughlin. I'm an artist uh, uh, and I, I lecture with, with Roy, uh, who's a colleague at the University of Northampton. So I'm an artist and I'm starting to playfully uh, add the title of occultural theorist. Um, so, uh, so yes, the hidden, invisible sort of shaping forces of culture is what I'm interested in, sort of the esoteric aspects of culture. Uh, and yeah, and sort of leading on from, I guess, what, what, what Dee said there, I mean, uh, Houghton, she's, she's definitely, obviously, a hugely important figure, but for, for me, I, I think wherever there's culture, there's occulture, um, uh, which are, are these uh, kind of ideas and their influence on culture and as well as there being places of exception I think there are times of exception and I think just like the occultural revival of the 19th century we seem to be having an occultural revival right now and I'm very excited by anyone that helps bring these ideas further into the popular understanding and the mainstream so uh, uh, my thanks to Dee for being involved in doing that and that's why I'm here. Fantastic. I'm going to move the monitor around so you get to you get to meet everyone. Okay. It's at you, yeah. Um, hello, uh, I'm Dali. It's great. Uh, I'm a painter. And I um, to This is very strange to me. I'm not used to talking to computers, but yeah. your people <laughs> behind, so I'll focus on you. Um, so I'm a painter. I've been uh, working uh, on what I call uh, the best description I can give it is uh, transcendental gateways. Um, I'm interested in the spiritual um, and the transcendental. The occult comes with it, the esoteric, the occult less, the esoteric more, uh, but really it is about um, the spiritual journeys uh, that I think uh, in one way or another uh, we all go through in life and in lives um, and um, painting is my own journey and they are spaces that allow 
the viewer hopefully to go on a journey as well. Um, so there is a relationship between the spiritual and the psychological and obviously the, um, the type of engagement you want on a social level um, in context of now, you know, it's very, it's the, you know, the, the situation is pretty dire to people who work within the spiritual uh, in contemporary art. So, um, yes, yeah, how you engage, how you engage with the with the discourse in a productive way, in a way that um, you can put your views across without getting shot down, uh, which is uh, an experience that I've had, and I'm sure my peers here have as well and uh, yeah um, make good work really uh, that's that's the main thing um, and that's more or less me okay over to you hi i'm chloe um i'm a curator um, i'm studying curating at the royal college of art at the moment um i'm interested in curating um the esoteric or primarily sort of art which puts forward alternative modes of knowledge production or alternative perspectives on the world which may not be so commonly accepted in other areas and which is not commonly accepted in the very sort of uh, one-dimensional art world. Um, so I guess I'm interested in uh, curating this art as a way of, sort of interrupting hegemonic narratives. Um, there's a phrase which I really love, um, which is witchy methodologies, which was put forward by the poet Holly Pester, um, and it's about sort of embracing non-totalizing um, narratives and histories. Um, and I think we could all do with a little bit of interrupting the narratives which have been um, sort of put forward over the last several centuries. So Janet, would you would you like to start? Well, I can start. Uh, let me just ask a question before I start. Um, I had prepared my five minutes, and everybody has been so brilliantly brief. Do you mind if I do my five minutes? <laughs> or you want me to say that for later? Tell us who you are. Okay, I'm Janet Sod Cook. I look like the grandmother to all of you there, <laughs> so the grand old lady. But um, I am an artist who works with light. I create sculptures that uh, reflect sunlight and I've been doing this for almost 40 years now uh, before it was even considered art and now everybody wants to say they're a multidisciplinary artist. But anyway, uh, I am, I want to thank you Dee for including me. It's fascinating. I love hearing about everybody's work. And I'm, you know, going to be very happy to tell you about mine when it comes to the five minutes version. <laughs> okay, that's who I am. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Carlos. Uh, I'm an artist and a lecturer. Um, I have been um, uh, illustrating. That's uh, my profession, uh, basically, but also painting and. Uh, lecturing itself for many years. Um, um, I'm, I have always been interested in, um, in uh, spirituality and um, the esoteric, the symbolic, the mythical. And um, for the last uh, five years, four years, uh, I have been uh, doing some research um, that I have been trying before in my studio um, in a more, um, let's say, organic way. So um, what I have been uh, doing basically in the research was to organize certain ideas that were a little dispersed before that. And uh, I will talk about that in, uh, in, in a bit, but uh, the thing is that uh, I'm interested in the relationship between art, play, magic, basically. Mm. Uh, I mainly use um, uh, a Jungian theoretical framework for my 
for my uh, yeah to to frame a little bit my my ideas, but I'm open to other frames, including the the esoteric in general. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Tonya. Hi, I'm Tonya. I'm not Alexandria, as it says down there. <laughs> I'm Tonya. Um, my background is in theater and arts education. However, I'm not officially a part of the talk today, <laughs> um, but I may chime in at some point if there's something that I have to add to, but I'm really uh, more here to support the technological aspects <laughs> overall. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, for organizing the tech. Brilliant. You're welcome. Oh, my big moment, and I'm muted. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Here, yay! I just, I just want to. Say thank you, Dee, for um, involving Artists United in the event last night and also in this panel discussion. I'm very excited to be part of this. I want to thank Tonya Jones for organizing the technical aspects of the panel discussion. Tonya works for Artists United as our events coordinator and she's also on our board of directors so she's a, a powerhouse. Uh, just a couple of technical things for us to help make this go more smoothly. If you're not talking, if you could please mute yourself because that'll cut down on background noise. And if you are speaking, if you can get as close to a microphone as you can, like for those of you who are all in the room together, it's a little difficult to hear you. So that'll help, just a little bit of um, technical advice. So my background is I'm a documentary filmmaker and have been for over 20 years. And I've produced films, I've directed films. I'm also a singer and um, have been doing um, club performances in San Francisco and Oakland, California. I'm um, also the founder of Artists United, and in addition to that, I'm also a practicing shaman. And I committed to that about two years ago. I've been on a path for over 20 years of development on the spiritual uh, side of things. And two years ago, I realized that I had intuitive abilities and very strong um, connections between the material and the spiritual world. So I made the commitment to become a practicing shaman. Uh, I've been training ever since then. I uh, formed a shamans collective that includes five other women shamans. Uh, my, I draw from a very eclectic um, source of spiritual knowledge. Um, for example, I've done some training in Taoist shamanism and also Egyptian shamanism, Native American shamanism, um, and other traditions. I do not work full-time in that capacity, but I do work when I'm called upon to do it, including spirit removal, house cleansing, um, soul retrieval, a lot of various different things, demonic depossessioning. Um, and I haven't spoken about this in public before, but this particular panel is very exciting to me because um, my mission, my personal mission is to unite artists and also to unite shamans and healers because these are two groups that have formerly been very um, isolated, marginalized, and it's time now for these groups of people to come together and use their abilities for good. So, thank you so much, Enough. 
so I'm going to put it sorry and I'm a big fan of the Italia Drag College of Art curating contemporary art and I'm interested in various fields. Uh, one of them is alternative way of curating art and I guess that's why I'm here. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. We've, we've all introduced ourselves. Um, we'll catch up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, you're not. You're not. You're not. Um, where should I put this monitor for all of us? I think it's a distance or... We can have the card to go. Yeah. So maybe put it here. So if anyone, if anyone seems to go first, or need to, no. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll do the first bit. Um, I'm just going to um, really, really reflect on what I wrote in in the in my little abstract, um, and, I, and I really. Oh. I don't think person is allowed to go yeah. Like yeah, exactly. My daughter. Um, and really just to throw open that, that questioning from the, um, from the abstract to say, what, what is it that, that, that we think is, is That the resistance is—is is there a resistance to this this type of information, or is it that I don't—I just—I just recently went for an interview at the Royal College for a PhD, and and I and I mentioned that there's a resistance to um, to the esoteric to 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 its production and description, and they said there isn't any. Because there's Kandinsky and Mondrian. That's it, really, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and 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 originally, uh, abstract expressionism as well is an expression of the sublime. Um, again, mostly pieces of art historical information that's not discussed. He said there isn't any resistance, which confused me completely because absolutely everyone that I speak to around this concept says there is. And my curiosity is for, is there, isn't there, and how do we move forward as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a group? Um, and I really want to just open it up to to the group to, 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 to have a conversation around that, your, your personal experiences and where you would like, what you would like to happen, your dream world, make it come true, the utopia. <laughs> Can I? Should, do you raise your hand? Uh, this is my first Stella. <laughs> I think you have to absolutely ignore any resistance. I mean, you can acknowledge it, but you're not going to change your vision as an artist. You're not going to change your direction because there's resistance. And in fact, what is resistance today, who knows 20 years down the road, that you were just way ahead of all of it. And, and you know, I am speaking as somebody who, had, who was not very difficult. I remember a curate, museum curator saying to me 30 some years ago, Oh, but what you're doing is not art, it's science. And I've been an artist all my life. I've never done science. But science is involved in what I do. So I'm saying to you about this magnificent movement, you just keep 
doing it. And then the world catches up to you. Now, that may sound naive, and when I was your age, I may have thought that was just a naive thing to say. But I can tell you from looking back now, it's not. It's a fact. You just do it. I think it's a great point, but actually, if you have a certain type of vision, you actually, I actually can't change that, that method and that way to work in sort of contemporary, uh, obtuse, sarcastic. I just, it just doesn't, I just resist it too much. I could do it. I did do a little bit, but I, yeah, you, I think. It's easy to back up from that. Yeah. It's great that you have all that experience. Uh, you say, so. Well, what may, sound like, what may sound like resistance today, you know, a decade from now could be look like lack of vision on those who were resistant. I mean, time is very elastic. What is true today is not necessarily going to be true you know, at the point, at another point in your life. So there's no way, I mean, it, as calling it resistance is one way to define it and to look at it. How about, you know, uh, that this is an aspect that you are dealing with with your art and it will actually give you energy in ways that you may not have if things were just way for, too easy. I just recently went for an interview at the Royal College for a PhD, and and I and I mentioned that there's a resistance to um, to the esoteric, to 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 its production and description, and they said there isn't any because there's Kandinsky and Mondrian. That's it, really, isn't it? <laughs> and. Uh, and, 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 and originally, uh, abstract expressionism as well is an expression of the sublime. Um, again, mostly a piece of art historical information that's not discussed. But he said there isn't any resistance, which confused me completely because absolutely everyone that I speak to around this concept says there is. And my curiosity is for, is there, isn't there, and how do we move forward as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a group? Listen, I think you have to absolutely ignore any resistance. I mean, you can acknowledge it, but you're not going to change your vision as an artist. You're not going to change your direction because there's resistance. And in fact, what is resistance today, who knows 20 years down the road that you were just way ahead of all. And, and you know, I am speaking as somebody who had, who was, it was very difficult. I remember a current museum curator saying to me 30 some years ago, oh, what you're doing is not art, it's science. Now I've been an artist all my life. I've never done science. The science is involved in what I do. So I'm saying to you about this magnificent movement, you just keep doing it. And then the world catches up to you. Now that may sound naive, and when I was your age, I may have thought that was just a naive thing to say. But I can tell you from looking back now, it's not. It's a fact. You just do it. I, I, I think it's a great point, but actually, if you have a certain type of vision, you actually, I actually can't change that that method and that way to work in this sort of contemporary uh, obtuse sarcastic I just it just doesn't I just resist it too much I could do it I did do a little bit but I yeah you I think 
it's it's easy to backtrack from that. Yeah, it's great that you have all that experience. Uh, as you say, thirty well, years. whether there is a resistance or not to um, yeah. esoteric slash etheric slash art. <laughs> uh, and so the, the answer given by the Royal College was, no, of course not, no problem. We have Mondrian, we have Kandinsky. Now, what I'm, what I'm asking is, you saying keep going <laughs> even though, you know, at, the, at this present moment in time, might not be regarded as art or might be regarded like you know that you were saying they thought I was doing science so I'm just wondering uh, whether you say keep going because if, because there is a resistance because then your answer to this question would be there is a resistance so it doesn't really matter uh, it doesn't really matter what the outside world think just go ahead or whether your position is just go ahead I forgot the question like I would like to know what's your actually point of view on whether in history of art and how we criticize art currently, there is whether, whether there is a discussion around esoteric, uh, the esoteric in general. Must even the thing is also it shouldn't have to be about esoteric art per se as an, an aesthetic language, but whether we can talk about themes and uh, and content of esotericism as a as a as a whole discipline of study and knowledge into contemporary art. The only thing I wanted to say that I didn't say to D, and I think addresses what you're asking me, is you may not find support in the traditional way where, you know, you think the wrong is for you as an artist. But what my own experience taught me is that in the early years, I had tremendous support from scientists, from technology companies, from, in other words, I just was, I functioned outside of that mainstream of the art world for many, many years, and there was enormous support, a lot of support. Just come back on that 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 concept. Um, I know, Dalit, you've experienced Dalit. Sorry, um, you've experienced a lot of this. I have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a reality, yeah, of, um, yeah, having to, um, what do you say, I do what I do, I do what I do regardless, uh, but I do come, uh, I do, I do come against resistance from, uh, um, yeah, it's hard to say actually. It's very, it's never very nebulous. This resistance, it's not, um, it's not so, um, it's not so total. It's really a way. I, f I find that it's really how you, um, how you present it to the world, um, and what words you use, and there are words that bring up a lot of resistance, such as, such as if you use the word God. That's a no, you know, you don't use the word God, okay? And sometimes naively you would use the word God, but actually you mean your own concept of God. But then, like, people would, um, I suppose, narrow it down to their own concept. So, really, people's concept of the spiritual, if they're not spiritually um, open and aware and curious, um, 
is um, uh, is pretty narrow. So it is a case about it is you know you're coming with a whole baggage of you know it's a good it's a good baggage um, uh, of experiences and thoughts and uh, senses and intuitions about the world and then once we start talking about it and that's why you know I really my language is paint you know my language is visual uh, I think part of the problem is that we do need to talk about it and we do need to make artist statements and uh, put it into language and that's where it all it, it can all fall apart in that place um, and yeah I've, I've yeah, I've had resistance, I've had support as well, you know, again, in the Royal College, I've had people supporting me, uh, tutors mainly, uh, I had a problem with uh, my, uh, my peers. Um, but yeah, it is about, I think they did try to, um, the thing is I'm very sensitive, so, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm a bit, I'm pretty stubborn and feisty, but at the same time, if I see that there is no, there's no um, uh, a cooperation or there's no real discussion going, it's just one person saying white and one the other saying black, and oh, there's no. So really, you need to define like-minded people, and that's that's where I'm at, mm. Uh, mm. and that's literally <laughs> where mm. we all um, mm. are. So yeah, fantastic. Does anyone else want to come in? The, the the online gang or Chloe, Kevin? I'd say one thing. Yes, please. Um, <coughs> um, I think uh, people are quite keen to do their five minutes and I'm quite keen to hear them, but I just wanted to to add to that because the word resistance keeps coming up. And when I when I do a seminar with my, my students and we talk about what art is which is probably an impossible question to answer, <laughs> and I'm saying probably being kind, um, uh, I often throw up this sort of board with a bunch of different memes, and one of them is art is resistance, which is quite a common meme and is, is seen around in a lot of different places. And I think the reason for that is because the artist can be framed in a lot of different ways, but one of the ways that the artist is framed is actually very similar to the mystic, which is this both social agitator and as solitary, right? Because they, they exist on the margins, um, they're non-normative in their approach to culture and cultural production and being in the world. And I think that that's, that's actually necessary for an artist, uh, for a good artist, because uh, you have to differentiate yourself. In fact, how does art differentiate itself from any other mode of production in the world? Uh, and so in order to differentiate, one has to be starkly different, one has to be non-normative. Uh, and so I think necessarily then one is setting oneself apart from normal modes of, of cultural production, normal modes of being in society. Uh, uh, and, and what you said about, um, you know, not paying attention to the sort of uh, modus operandum of society or the expectations, well, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, we, we're talking about esoteric art, but I think, you know, perfectly understood, all art kind of is or should be esoteric. When it stops being esoteric, it kind of becomes less of, of, of art. And that, that's an opinion, but I mean, the, you know, the, the differentiation between uh, an artifact and a formulaic production and a piece of art is this kind of visionary aspect and this sort of willingness to differentiate oneself both in, uh, in process, uh, in one's own being and in what one produces. Uh, so so uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to add that as an addendum. Hi um, So. I mean, in talking about all of this resistance to esoteric art, and I'm using esoteric just as a cover rule at the moment because, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think any of us have one word to describe all of this. Um, so I know that it's narrow and it's insufficient, but I'm going to have to use it. Um, it's interesting to me because what I've found recently is a sort of huge embracing of esoteric art in contemporary galleries and so it's, it's yeah. everywhere. Tarot is everywhere. Witchy stuff is everywhere, sort of folkloric 
uh, pagan aesthetic craft is everywhere. Um, and with a lot of very um, su successful contemporary artists. I mean, I'm thinking shamanic work by an um, artist called Florence Peak. She's really big at the moment. Um, this sort of collective called Forthland, they have a lot of exhibitions at the moment and they sort of do community based crafting um, about sort of different memory and, and sort of handheld knowledge, they call it. Um, people like Valentina Desideri and Denise Ferreri da Silva. And it's so, I, I, I sort of, it's very interesting to talk about this resistance because at the same time as that stuff being everywhere, I totally accept and understand that there is resistance in so many other areas and I'm wondering why the sort of differentiation and where these sort of two poles are coming from. And what I'm thinking of is that saying these are, it's a very genuine desire to express something, the, the aura pluri. Um, is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> That's, that's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> um, but it's very genuine. Um, and I find maybe the resistance is also towards a sense of being genuine. Um, because a lot of the art that is embraced is maybe being used to make a political point or um, is being used as a tool. So maybe the resistance is not necessarily to the esoteric, but to the genuine expression of the esoteric. Um, or sort of heartfelt, because I don't think people like things that are heartfelt. It's a very good one. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. brilliant. Um, anyone else online bursting to, to add to, the, um, to, to this bit of the conversation? Uh, uh, it 
might, uh, you, you might uh, not even find the resistance, you find the denial uh, or manipulative asylum. So, uh, these things happen. And my experience is like, if you try to go in the academic world with, with this, if you, if you put it more than front in the very beginning, it could be complicated uh, as well. So, uh, there is uh, always a bridge of uh, young young psychology or archetypal psychology that might be helpful to, to deal with the problem. Um, but uh, even even using that is counter-cultural, as you probably know. So, uh, well, that's, that's my point of view. Uh, Great, thank you very, very much. Holly, would you like to um, would you like to say anything about this topic, and then I think we'll we'll move on to your five minutes or more. Would you like to? Is there something that does this resonate with you at all? I feel like everybody's pretty much given good insights into that. I don't have anything particular to add, but I'm just excited to be having a conversation with other artists, and also with us being located all in these various different countries and places and just this is the hope of the future for us with artists coming together and being able to have these discussions and just share our connections and resources so thank you so much Dee. i really appreciate it we should perhaps leave more than okay great thank you so much so as um i mentioned i'm holly million and i'm the founder and executive director of artists united we are an art an artist led movement for the economic and political empowerment of artists and our objective is to create the largest network of artists in all disciplines that the world has ever seen. We're trying to enable artists um, helping each other by sharing resources, connections, moral support, friendship, job opportunities, and we're also uh, working towards uh, using art and the network of artists as a force for social change worldwide. We're very young, we've been around for two years, and already we have a national board in the United States of 42 working artists, all different disciplines, and we also have representatives in 24 different countries worldwide, including Spain and the United Kingdom, and four different countries in Africa, and Asia, and South America, and the Middle East. Um, I'm very, very uh, proud to be here. I am motivated to create this organization because I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I have been for 20 years. But I'm also um, a shaman, and I started to use that word and being um, very direct about um, using the term only very recently because it is uh, a term that's charged with meaning and it hasn't always been something that has been approved of in American culture. It's something that's viewed as a possibly as a, cult a cultural appropriation or uh, a disrespect to native cultures. But what I'm seeing is a renaissance of um, shamanism and I'm seeing it becoming more mainstream and I've since I've made the commitment to be a working and practicing shaman, I've, been, I've met many, many people who are working in this field in a wide variety of ways. And I guess what I would like to say, the most important thing I can say is that all of us have abilities, intuitive abilities, uh, superpowers, if you will. And um, just as all of us have within us an artist, and our society hasn't always enabled us to express these things. It has been suppressed. Our creativity is in many ways is censored or um, curtailed. And our spiritual gifts, likewise, have been um, curtailed. But we're in a time of renaissance, I feel, on Earth, where people are being called to come forward with their gifts and to not be afraid to talk about them, to share them, and even more exciting is that there's a movement happening of people turning towards collective action and organizing and starting to cooperate in ways that have has never been possible before. I think the reason that Artists United has grown so quickly 
is that we are in a time where technology supports innovative ways for people to connect on a massive scale. And um, this is uh, my personal mission is to be a connector. And I started Artists United for that purpose, but I've also started to connect other shamans and healers and psychics and intuitives into their own collective groups. I'm part of a shamanic collective of uh, there are six women shamans. We all started to work together. We meet monthly. There are some of them have been practicing for 30 years. I'm new to this, but I'm very active and doing a lot of work. So I appreciate having elders in the in this collective who can advise me, and I'm also providing support for them as well. So for me, um, this is a very exciting time in our world, and I um, am inviting people to connect with me, to connect with Artists United, if you believe that artists can change the world, and that we should connect with each other. And I also invite you to connect with me if you are exploring the spiritual world and you want to do something to help connect the spirit and material world in order to make this world a better place. And I'm um, just delighted to be part of a group of people having this conversation. Um, th this is revolutionary. We haven't been able to have these conversations before. So Dee, thank you for being such a visionary and for also being so brave about sharing your own experiences. It's not always supported. You sometimes will get um, negative responses. Um, I really appreciated your story about the blue square that you, that you had the vision of. I had a similar experience two years ago where I, uh, I saw a quantum tunnel open in front of me and it was about 12 feet long, and at the end of the tunnel, I saw my five-year-old self looking at me. And it wasn't an image, it was fully dimensional, real. She's looking at me. And I was with somebody else at the time who said to me, in that moment, I see a child, is that you? And it was the fact that there was another person that witnessed what I was Experiencing that validated it for me. It blew my mind. And it was one of the most important experiences that I've ever had because what it did was it indicated that, yes, you do have these intuitive abilities. And, yes, there's much more to this world than meets the eye. And there's so much more to explore. And we need to bring this information forward and share it broadly. So that's my story. And at this time, I consider myself an artist, shaman, healer, and leader. Those are the four things that are my, uh, part of my mission. So thank you for letting me tell my story and for being part of this conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Holly. That's uh, absolutely um, amazing. Um, vision that you have also to bring so many artists together and also that you've you've achieved this in record time. I think Tony you said ten thousand in a year. Uh, absolutely extraordinary um, how you're um, bringing people together. And what's fascinating as in your introduction you said you were a founder or the founder of Artists United. So therefore at the very core of Artists United is a, um, um, what, in my words, an etheric practice, um, energy. It's exciting! Yay! <laughs> um, <laughs> um, people, how are you responding? I think many people have tried that and failed, so I'd like to know what she attributes her success to in bringing artists together. Can you, did you hear that? I said, uh, many people have tried and failed to do what you're doing, so I'd like to know what you attribute your success to in bringing people together under one umbrella. Well, thank you so much for asking that, and I, I feel like it's still a work in progress, and it's still very, a very delicate thing that we're, we're doing. It's a young organization. The reason that we've been able to grow it so quickly is that we 
set out from the very beginning to be an organization that wasn't hierarchical, but that had a flat structure. And that we would, we, I wanted to make sure that I was sharing power from the very beginning. So I decided that we would have a board of up to 50 people to start. And it was, a, was met with skepticism by many people. They said, you're crazy. Why are you trying to create such a large board? It's going to be impossible coordinate. And I said, well, I'm going to give it a try. I don't care if I fail because um, I have an instinct based on many years of work with organizations that if you are bold and if you, if you understand the, the rules, then you can break them. I said, well, this is one of those rules that needs, that needs to be broken. If we have a large board, we can create a movement. If you're creating a movement, you don't want to be cautious. You want to go for it. So we immediately recruited a very large group of people. The original board was 37 people. We agreed that we could go up to 50. At this time, there are 42. There are two people who are moving to the United States from other countries that represent our chapters in those countries that are coming to the US. They are now applying to be on our board. So we have a person from Spain and a person from Norway who will be joining our board. Uh, the board members are very diverse, and they're covering the full range of the United States. And it's because of that size of that board and their willingness to build this organization that we've been able to grow it so fast. The number of introductions, the number of partner organizations they've connected us to, um, the number of events that we've been able to host, that's what's given us the critical mass. So um, what remains to be seen is how we sustain it and support it. So we're entering that critical phase at the two-year mark where we need um, resources, we need support, and um, we are, are, but what we're seeing is there's a desire for this, there's a need for this. We're getting um, a very solid response. We have um, events, for example, that are committed that are taking place in as diverse places as Poland and uh, China and all across the United States. We've had two events in Barcelona, Spain. We've had an event in Namibia. Uh, so the artists are hungry for this. What they're saying to us is that they feel isolated. Um, there are artists that we're representing in our network that are in places as diverse as Indian reservations in Canada, to Rust Belt cities in Ohio in the United States, Amazing. to the rural south of the United States, and then artists in urban areas all over Europe. Um, what's important is that the artists are desiring the connection. So that's what we're creating and making possible. And it, the first job is just to help the artists. We're helping them by making it easier for them to find resources. Uh, artists that are part of our network have been hired for jobs. They've uh, started to work together collaboratively on projects. They've formed friendships. But there's much, much more, much, much more that we want to do. And the vision is that as we grow this, we're creating an artist army. And it's an army of peace, love, and joy, and creativity. And that um, we're using art to change people's awareness, but also to bring people together. You, you know, you just said you want to use that organization for a change, and social change, and uh, in a way it does have a political um, vibe. However, not a, a real political statement. I do understand you want to use creativity like you, like as a main driven. However, I'm wondering what kind of then what kind of activity because at the beginning when you mentioned it, I thought it was more like a trade union for artists' rights. So what I'm wondering is what kind of activities, what kind of you know when you say we've done uh, events in many cities around the world, what are what are they about like? How does the organization, like if I will join the organization, what do we do? We have found that what works well is first we get people together in person. And so we are hosting these events. That we bring together 20 to 50 people at a time. They come together into the room. There's an intake process. We gather their information. We take a photo. We then introduce them to each other in the room. And they start to talk and they start to share information. At the events, we're also presenting online discussions like this one during the events. So there's information they're receiving. In some cases, they're going to hear about uh, knowledge for artists or business knowledge for artists or marketing yourself as an artist, things that are very practical. At the same time, we also, while
while we have them gathered in the room, we have them participate in advocacy actions, whether that's signing a petition to change laws in the city where they live that may affect artists, or have them write letters to their local politicians, or have a discussion about issues that they're facing that we need to address that we can support. So those are the things that happen in those events. We're also building an online platform so that artists can have their own personal profile page and be able to find each other. We're, we have a prototype that's being designed now. So at these events, when they get signed up, they're first in line to get one of their own profile pages. Um, what we're moving towards as we get more organized is that we would then take all of these people that are coming into our organization and we would enlist them in using their art for certain social causes. Our, our intention is that once a year we pick one thematic area as a focus and that we solicit art contributions from our members to help raise awareness about those things. We either curate that and then we travel the world with that exhibit or we put the information out online, we share it. And um, you can think about examples of how this has been done already. For example, um, I think we know about um, one of the most famous artists who's a political artist is uh, Shepard Fairey. So he created a series of images in the United States of diverse faces of people um, in red, white, and blue, the colors of the United States flag, as a way to fight against um, the fears of immigrants, fears of people who look different. And these uh, images have been used in marches all across the U.S. So our vision is that if we could harness a lot of artists doing similar things on a certain subject, that, that, would, that would, it would be critical mass. This year, uh, because we're young and new and we want to accomplish as much as we can with this with the small structure that we have, we decided to focus on artists and housing because housing is such a critical need for artists. And in uh, Oakland, California, where I live and where we're headquartered, uh, you may have heard about it. In December of 2016, there was a warehouse fire in the city that killed 37 people and almost all of them were artists. It was a converted warehouse space that artists had turned into a live work space. And because of the tragedy, it called into people's minds the fact that we don't have affordable or safe housing or work spaces for artists. So we formed right after that fire and we decided from, the, from that moment that housing would be our focus area. So we're working towards a, a, a direction where we're going to have artists doing art on housing and homelessness as a way for the artist to help show the need to a greater audience. So it's very much a work in progress, but that's the, those are the basic steps. We're trying to get people connected and trying to connect them so that they can benefit. Well, that is, I'm getting, I'm getting those spooky vibes. Why I should still get, think like that, I have no idea. You know what I mean? You go, oh, we know all this stuff is, 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 is there. What I'm, what I'm talking about is that this exhibition, uh, the sales from this exhibition, the proceeds, 10%, is going to a homeless charity in the UK uh, called The Big Issue. How weird is that? <laughs> so your, your origins, again, um, yeah, interesting. It's absolutely mind-blowing. That's a direct example. You're you're doing that work with your art to help enable people who are homeless. That's really a, that's fantastic. Thank you. That's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, it's it's mind blowing what you're what you're um you're looking to achieve. That's good. Very well. Okay. So um yeah uh as I said I. I have been developing uh, an approach to my work in um, illustration and painting as well, um, drawing all the activities, uh, artistic activities that I like to do. And um, rather organically, uh, what started to happen was that um, I started to develop this kind of play-based uh, approach. Um, 
through the research, I, I managed to understand that uh, one of the main um, the main reasons for for this approach was had to do with the the decline of the of the illustration um, business, a business that was uh, working for a pretty in a pretty successful way, but suddenly there was a, a big decline. Uh, my uh, idea today is that it has to do mainly with consumers or cultural habits. Um, there are many reasons for this. I'm not going to explain that now because it's uh, um, The thing is, uh, I found myself um, using this kind of uh, play-based approach and. Uh, uh, the reason why was that uh, play, police, play sorry, is an hotelic activity. You do it for its own sake. So um, I started drawing because it was fun. Just that it was pleasurable. And it made me connect with my potential. I found things about myself that I enjoyed. Some of them were uh, lightful, some of them were very dark. And I liked them all. So. Um, this is the, the way I presented uh, uh, this uh, mini abstract uh, as uh, finding the demonic uh, in the ludic because uh, I understand this approach to drawing uh, using play uh, as, a, um, as a way of going to the underworld, my own, my, my own underworld. Um, which could be connected, of course, with my personal and uh, unconscious and the collective unconscious. And with this I'm saying, that also, uh, this is not, it's more like Hillman's approach, uh, more phenomenological in the sense that uh, I think the unconscious is inside and outside at the same time. It's pretty much like astrology, it's like uh, the archetypes are, are in the cosmos and they are inside, so I'm not making, marking this distinction that uh, Young did very much like going down or inside or just that. Okay. Uh, the thing is, um, there is an important thing regarding the the play, which is uh, chance. Uh, one of the, the possible elements of play um, is chance. Chance is like a surprise, and it connects with synchronicity. Synchronicity uh, transcends the causal causal. Um, uh, reason uh, of events and uh, connects you with a uh, causal uh, phenomena. Therefore, um, the way I understand uh, the demonic and my own demon uh, is uh, something that uh, is a causal. Of course, I can also explain it in. Uh, in uh, I can give it a certain historicity. Let's say. But uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's outside uh, our regular understanding of time. My, my demon chose me in a way, um, and I, I connect with it uh, through the playful. Um, as I said, I, I cannot uh, show the images uh, I depicted of my demon but uh, I, I cannot describe it very quickly. It is like a dead bird, uh, sort of uh, as the skull of a raven, and it's covered with a black glow. Uh, it seems pretty much like death, uh, but it's, uh, it has a shamanic aspect as well, very shiny one, all made of light, uh, kind of uh, fluorescent lights. It uh, has different aspects, that's why I, I'm always saying that I give depictions of it because uh, I cannot uh, completely uh, um, illustrate it uh, in the sense of uh, giving a total information of what this creature in particular is. Um, what I search in my with my approach is basically a, um, a kind of a lucid dreaming state, uh, which allows me through the playful activities to uh, enter the dream. Uh, being conscious. Uh, this consciousness uh, of the activity allows me to channel the, 
the information in a more uh, direct way, but of course I have to lose myself in play to be able to do this kind of thing. So if I'm rational, um, it would be stopping the information. And uh, of course I can extend in the number of activities, playful, um, active imagination, all these things I will not, but uh, what I can say is that I have been developing a rather systematic way of, of approaching this uh, particular creature and the stories that, uh, that shows me, let's say. Um, uh, my, my, uh, as I explained, my ideas can be very well described using a, a Jungian uh, theoretical approach, but also archetypal. I'm, I'm referring to James Hillman, Romanishin, uh, Henry Corbin as well, uh, regarding the imaginal world, uh, transpersonal psychology, I'm talking about Roth, uh, for instance, or Joseph Campbell regarding mythology. So there are a number of, uh, of possible approaches. I sometimes, um, uh, yeah, also draw from, from certain, yeah, it's actually an, um, Hillman's approach to it, Freud, not Freud directly, but anyway, uh, basically that's uh, the, the, what I do with my, with my approach. Um, an interesting idea regarding the, the concept of, of, of demon, of course I, I, I skipped this part, but I'm using the, the word demon in the, in the Greek sense, uh, um, meaning Pla Plato and, uh, and Plotinus, basically. Um, I, I, I think uh, also that there is something that could be associated with the, with the satanic in the sense of, uh, of, um, of separating. I mean, there is this concept of a sh shaitan or, or the, it means a, a disturbance of the unity. When we are rational, we tend to believe that our only self is the rational side, which is the conscious side. When we um, go in the process of, we start the process of individuation, and if we dare to go to the underworld, we discover that there is another side of us, which is the shadow. This shadow contains the demonic. Uh, so we discover the, 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 the diversity of the archetypes there, uh, which could be related very easily to, for instance, archetypal astrology or something like that, you know, like the, the many aspects of the psyche manifested in different kind of gods. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a separation in a way. Uh, the, the process, in a way, it's, a, it's an iteration. I'm not going to, to say that it finishes uh, ever, but uh, after you return from this separation, this confrontation with the shadow, uh, you return with a symbol, uh, which is uh, it's, uh, in itself a word that, that will not connotes the union, um, growing together, a symbolon. Uh, so the thing is, uh, this is the double process of separation to confront the other side of the coin, let's say, and then come back to, to present the union of, the, of this uh, coin. And that's basically the process. I hope I explain myself. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Wonderful. Um, who, who would like to, to respond? Uh, question, Carlos. His, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, when you speak of that, can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. When you speak about the demon, um, you know, there is a word <coughs> that is very together with the demon word, but it's spelled daemon, D A I O S, which actually means. Spirit guide, and I found yeah, yeah. yeah I found that fascinating. That's what he means. You know, yeah, I think there, you're, you're, that you're, that you were connecting into, you know, that I mean, you're telling us that it's not just the dark side, but there's a demon that's the light side. It's all the same thing. It is, yes, from my point of view. Uh, uh, has different stages, of course, and, and I actually, um, yeah, I, I meant to use the, this um, word, the daemon, but uh, 
Actually, I, I read in the dictionary it says that this distinction is made to separate from the evil demon. The thing is, uh, I'm not very sure if this distinction sh should be made in a way, because uh, this is exactly what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, and the shadow implies all that. So we have to be very careful with that. But, uh, yes. But somebody who works with light, I can tell you, light is only visible when you have shadow. You have darkness to see the light. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. with Um the problem is that I'm not really familiar with Hillman. So some of what, like it's not the first time I hear you talking about this and I got li a little bit lost. However though, um, I've been reflecting a little bit about playfulness and um, I really like what you say about the ludic? Ludic. The ludic moment, which is I've been mm. basically with friends of mine which are performers but also artists in general I guess, or people, people that experience life and think about it. Uh, <coughs> basically, we were reflecting on on how uh, playfulness also open like could be a, as well an an, al an altered uh, state of mind because then within the moment of play you are usually you put yourself in different relation both with the environment with your own self and with other people so I think uh, like this joint and also playfulness and ludic in general um, I think is usually associated with like childhood and uh, kids and uh, so you know a little bit like being genuine and innocent so in a way going back to about being genuine I think that that could be an element of that that we could <coughs> learn about making art and at the same time um, there could be an element of again sort of going beyond barriers of language so when we speak about ludic things and playfulness we could also bring them uh, back into the adulthood as well, and not just um, um, how do you say limit our vocabulary and language to to like childhood, so that you know what you're saying about ludic states and like um, drawing for pleasure and then embracing pleasure as well as as something that can lead to al like altered states of or of consciousness or like a deeper awareness or, or things like that. I was just commenting on. Like I think, you know, bringing on different languages and vocabularies can actually open up a conversation and different methodologies as well to reach certain states, for example, or just as well to have an open conversation with different people about the same thing. Yes, uh, let me may, may I answer you a couple of things. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, I think it might be interesting for you. Um, remember. Uh, our last discussion um, after the performance in Northampton, the last time, yes. And uh, there is a book called um, From uh, Diversion to Subversion, uh, edited by David Getzi, uh, an art curator uh, from the United States. I, I believe you, I think you are going to find it interesting. Uh, another thing, uh, I mean, the title of the book is quite uh, significant because uh, it starts uh, with the version, with uh, apparently with entertainment, with uh, uh, yeah, wasting time even, and you find yourself in play. Uh, but uh, many times, what you can find is a version. This is the aspect that I'm more interested in uh, related to, as related to play because subversion means uh, change, subversion means transformation, exactly. uh, transmutation, whatever you want to use as a synonym of that uh, alteration of uh, your initial state. The moment you start to play, uh, you are one, uh, after you play, you should be another. Uh, that's my, my opinion. Another thing. The concept of ludus, uh, I mean ludic, ludus, uh, is related uh, as, a, as an antonym, uh, there is interlude. 
and this uh, connects with uh, what I mentioned uh, regarding mythology. Uh, mythology is, a, sorry, myth itself. Myth is a very particular uh, thing because a myth always implies a story. There is always a narrative in myth, but um, that narrative is outside of time. So play is related to myth because it happens outside of time. When you enter the magic circle, this is another concept that, that was introduced by, by Wissinger, very related to shamanism and, uh, and anthropology in general, it's like you create a magic circle around yourself to be able to play because the world of play is very fragile. Uh, it can be very easily destroyed. If you are playing something and someone comes and interrupts you or your mobile uh, rings or whatever, the, the, the world of play, uh, the ludus, uh, will be destroyed. So you have to protect yourself with the magic circle to make sure you're not interrupted. This is what uh, I was talking about uh, before regarding the different levels of play. I have been trying some of them very, very uh, strange. Uh, the thing is, um, that's another concept that, that is very relevant. The magic circle makes sure that you can transcend time in a way. And that's the place where you bring your uh, metaphors, your symbols back from the journey. In this kind of sacred play, uh, the mission you have is usually to heal yourself. So. Um, it can be the experience itself, but actually the, the, what moves you to, to take the trip is to, to bring something that helps you to deal with the transformations that you leave as dissociation, uh, or, um, or simply to heal yourself, to put it uh, in, in a few words. Yeah, and I, um, so, I think this also relates, uh, relates to the fact that um, like play and these sort of states um, always involves your body and your mind, like you can't have a state of pleasure or a state of being entertained without having your body as well experiencing that, you know what I mean? Like you can have, you can always, mm, I don't, yeah, I guess if you, if you put your, no, I could be criticized on that, but yeah, no, I just wanted to say what, like whether actually in a, in a way, so you could have a state of playfulness or a ludic state. Um, where you know, in a way you're able to transcend time both with mind and body um, so that you know when because I was thinking about you drawing or I was thinking about uh, doing something pleasurable for me which is knitting and so it's like usually when you enter that sort of or when you're playing you're playing a game so you set rules and you let's say you even play volleyball you know what I mean something like mundane in a way um, then you are actually engaging with your body so I think as well there is also an element of like engaging both on, on two levels, mind and body, to maybe go a little bit further. But also maybe not. You could just engage with your mind or with your body and reach the same state. Yeah. Which implies... Well, yeah, which yeah, implies this is an important income. concept uh, that... Um, uh, uh, this is something I haven't mentioned uh, today, but the thing is another theoretical framework that I use is that of Mikhail Chiks and flow. Mikhail regarding the concept of flow. Uh, I, I will explain that very simply, but you have to balance your skills with the, with the challenges you set. If you, um, if you are able, let's say you have a very developed skills and the challenge is low, uh, you will feel bored and probably uh, an aut automatism will enter. So the thing is, if automatism enters, let's say, if I always draw the same thing, nothing new will happen. Uh, there will not be any change, any subversion of the kind I was mentioning. So, of course, this uh, puts us in front of this the concept of uh, different types of play. And uh, my favorite type of play is uh, the one that involves, as I said, uh, magic circle in the sense of um, entering a liminal state, a state of transformation, of actually of undefinedness in a sense of uh, to, to challenging uh, my idea of myself in, in, in a, in a constant, yeah, just a way of, of saying it, like uh, whatever happens, 
will be a transformation and whatever returns is going to be something different. But of course, uh, that asks a lot of you, a lot of attention, and of course many times uh, we can leave the experience as uh, repetitive, which will be the interlude, uh, the, the repetitive life of every day. Right? I forgot to tell all of you um, about who I am. A talent reader for almost 50 years. I come from a family of readers. Uh, I feel that my art springs from the same intuitive place. Uh, that's why I'm a good reader. <laughs> but but um, anyway, it's, it's all very connected. And, and I was reminded of that when Holly was speaking. So it's really a pleasure to be with all of you today. Learn about everybody's work and to have the opportunity to tell you about mine. So, 39 years ago, I invented a new way to create art by using sunlight and time and reflection and motion. And I call this sun drawing. Sun drawing is a process that involves the interaction of the light from the sun with the rotation of the earth and highly reflective elements that I shape and assemble and then place in the path of sunlight. So as direct sunlight touches these elements, an image of light very gradually appears on surrounding walls and surfaces. So these images slowly and subtly change in harmony with the cycle of the sun. So astronomical considerations are very important when I plan a sun drawing because of the change of the high point of the sun's path throughout the year. However, forms that change with the changing sunlight also return at the same point in the yearly cycle. And that's very important to me because what I'm trying to express is visible multiple change occurring through time together with the absolute certainty of what is constant and the constant is return. So the materials I use are a variety of metals but I also use glass that is optically coated with multi-layered interference coatings. So these coatings of glass break light into the colors through the phenomenon of light interference. So the colors you're seeing in my sun drawings are the pure colors of light. There are no pigments. And because they are caused by interference phenomena, the colors also shift with the shifting angle of sunlight. And that reinforces my concerns with time marking and cyclical time. So shortly after I started working with sunlight, I realized that I didn't know nearly enough about the cycle of the sun to be using it as medium to create my art. And that's when I began to do some research and site work <laughs> at ancient sun marking sites. So I started out in the American Southwest. I studied and I documented sun marking sites. And while, while I was doing this in 1983, I actually discovered <coughs> oh. and documented a summer solstice phenomenon in, that is called Wikiji. Chaco Canyon is in New Mexico. 21 years later, in 2004, NASA did confirm that this is an authentic Anasazi, which would mean 11th century sun marking, solstitial sun marking phenomenon, and that I was the first one to discover it and to document it. So then from the southwest, I traveled to the pyramids at Teotihuacan in Mexico, and then on to India to study 18th century astronomical observatories of Jai Singh in 
Dengli, and in Jaipur. Now, although originally I went to these sites to study about the cycle of the sun, what I got and found went so far beyond that because I found the very historic roots of my art and a deep source of inspiration that continues to this day. But even more important than that, I discovered that the direct experience of the earth and sky has a profound effect on the human spirit, the kind of impact and the kind of effect that is very much missing in our lives today. It's if the human heart has a much to uh, that's unacknowledged that goes that 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 seeps into into that work um, and all of your experiences and your travels and your investigations and years and years of, of, of considerations go into this one piece which is uh, then experienced and, and delighted uh, uh, another person that's wonderful. Really, it's very simple. That what people, what this, what this little guy was experiencing, was the heavens doing something, and he didn't have to understand all of the physics and optics and astronomy and all of that. All he knew was that when he put his hands on his heart and said, and he, his English was not very good, and he actually said, it makes me happy. Oh my God. I mean, as an artist, what else could you ask for? And you know, this is like one of the earliest impulses in my work is the artist Joseph Boyce. And I, in 1979, I was, I went to 
the time to see his huge retrospective. And as, as beautiful as the objects and the drums are that were in the Guggen Hive, what I spent hours doing and what I was tremendously moved by were the videos, the films of him doing this, what he called the discourses with students, with the public. But I'll never forget that he said this thing about making art. And he said, because somebody challenged him, and because he was a social activist as well as an artist, but he, they, they challenged him, how could you do something as frivolous as making art when the world is in such a bad shape and people are starving? And he said, he said, it, it begins in thought, in mind. You give form to your thought with words. And then the words go forth and they create an experience. And when people, even one person, hears and hears your words and gets this experience, that they maybe will go out into the world and say, what else, what is there around me that I have not been paying attention to? And that one person being changed other people, and this is how you change the world. And, I, and I'm thinking about, you know, Holly, what she's saying about Artists United. I know the motto is, you know, uh, many artists can change the world. And, and when I heard Joseph Boyce talking about Ethan, it's like the, even the voice of the wilderness. One person hearing that voice can take that into the world. And the world can be changed by that. Lovely. Any anyone looking to respond uh, further to Janet's extraordinary concept of sun? Come on. Please. <coughs> it's it's not a massive. Oh, hang on. It's not a massive response. It was just a very small point. You're talking about when the. Uh, something mediated through the artistic process and the uh, the spectator, the audience, and then and, and one person being changed and sort of uh, butterfly effect of that. But uh, I've, I've had this discussion before with some artists who produce visionary art and um, never show it to anybody and then hence try to, they, but, they, but they try to not define themselves as artists and, 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 I, and I think it's, it, one shouldn't forget as an artist that if you're saying one person, that, that that's two people because the artist is um, inevitably changed by the process as well. So uh, I think that's an important part of it that as an artist uh, uh, that, that we, we shouldn't forget. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think the, the idea is if you're creating, it's already implied to share. It has to go out. We want to others to experience or to see it. You know, one other point I wanted to make, it's a technical point, but it's actually when people hear this, that it also has that transforming potential. You know, when I talk about colors in the sun drawing being caused by, they're the pure colors of light, they're caused by interference phenomena. What that means is that these colors are right now present all around us. But they are invisible. This is part of the etheric art of being able to see what is not. So when the interference coatings interfere with the light, literally, these colors suddenly become visible. This is about even when we, when we look out into space and we say, well, you know, there's dark matter out there. We don't know. That is not necessarily dark matter. That is just the limits of how we are trying to see. Someday, we'll suddenly have something, and I'm sure it's going to end up being very simple, that makes all of that visible. You see? And, and, and a poet about the light waves, a poet said to me many, many years ago, he said, you know, he said, when he saw my art, he experienced it, and we talked about colors. He said, it's like making the invisible visible. 
And see, this goes with the whole use of voice idea. That makes one person go out there and say, what else is all around me that's so beautiful that they can sing? Maybe I need to pay more attention, you know. Anyway. Fantastic. Further responses? Um, one one final thing, Janet. Have you bumped into Rupert Sheldrake and um, the Conscious Son? You know, I believe that I, he and I were at the same conference at the Royal Institution back in I think it was 1999. And we both spoke. I, I remember because when you mentioned him, I, I have to get into my files and and confirm. But I do believe, yeah. Yeah, I do believe that I heard him speak and met him and, you know, we had conversations. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. He did a fascinating talk with the Scientific and Medical Network um, about um, about the conscious sun. Of course, immediately that sounds bonkers, absolutely bonkers as an idea. But actually, as he, as he drew it out, um, it's actually not that extraordinary somehow there's 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 a depth to it that that's challenging that you can you can go with it yeah it's brilliant and what's the idea that the sun is conscious effectively literally effectively but not such an extraordinary idea given the ancient greeks and, and apollo uh given uh ra the sun god given that our oh, very gods come from these these concepts themselves the solar christ um. River, I think River posits that at every level, isn't it? So he's panpsychism, but each thing has its own level of consciousness, yeah. including at the mm. planetary level. Mm. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Which is a whole nother set of resistance and argument. <laughs> Again, you say that, but panpsychism's all the rage. Ah. It is very much all, all vogue. Yeah. I think your work is great for that nebulous, yeah. Well, I mean, you can imagine when you talk about the resistance, I started doing this almost 40 years ago. And so when I did not get the support from, you know, the, the, contem the art world, the contemporary art world, I got, in, as I told you before, enormous support from scientists and, and companies, you know, corporations supplied me tens of thousands of dollars in free materials. I mean, I, I'm telling you, I got a lot of support. So here's a way to do what is in your heart to do, but you just have to be like water. You know, you have to go around every barrier. Keep flowing, yeah. Fantastic. Um, we've got one final one for you. But you're I think because you brought up the resistance, it's, yes. already, it's already kind of... We've already had that yeah. conversation, yeah. yeah. Um, this will be, I think, a good time to, to have a break. And um, is that going to, Tanya, Tanya, is that uh, a nightmare with the technology to do that? Or can we... No, can I mean, everyone... Come back in a few minutes. Um, yeah. Walk away and do what you want. Like Fantastic. That. <laughs> Lovely. Well, so I'll leave it all on, yeah? And we're just go and kind of have a bit of a mingle and yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. and then probably in that mingling if you could let your um, I'm trying I'm trying to get some vocabulary around this but not your unconscious not your subconscious but the other bit uh, which is kind of where we're going to I'm thinking of limb conscious lud conscious that that thing the altered state. I want a word for it. Perhaps we can develop one between us. Um, let it work on what. What are the strands that we want to draw from, for, for to try and to try and bring something together a little from the conversation. Again, um, it's very tight. It's very hard for me to speak both to uh, you guys and the people in the room, and I find it a bit difficult, so it's if I'm a bit, yeah, I feel a bit, yeah, I've, I've never done this before, I don't do Skype or nothing like that, so um, uh, bear with me. Um,
so um, what, what I've picked what I've picked on um, is really like the, the the spiritual is a very is a, is very deep and very wide um, thing being uh, being involved in and I think it's difficult to you're asking us to think of a word, you know. Um, I think there's uh, something universal about the spiritual or the esoteric or that other dimension, uh, but there's something deeply, deeply personal about it. Um, and in a way, we want to keep this personal and be able to A, support each other, you know, uh, moral support, um, if you feel resistance, you know, that it's, it's there, you know, but you, you bypass it, you know, uh, you either uh, uh, deal with it uh, head on or you ignore it, I, I'm not sure, I'm still, still trying to work it out. Um, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, actually. I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. Um, like for instance, just to take uh, like your two practices, uh, um, Janet and Carlos, uh, you went from very different... Can you hear me all right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you went from very, like the... the that's why I, I think it's a bit dangerous to want to, and you said this, Carlos, it's very dangerous, or maybe you didn't say it's very dangerous, um, but there's a risk in uh, trying to hom homogenize what we're doing, because we're all working from a different place that is our personal place. Um, and, you know, I think the contrast between how you work and how you work Janet is, um, you know, you work with the with the c celestial bodies, with the sun. Uh, there's nothing, um, you know. It's it's not it's it's your conversation with it, uh, but it's it's about going in out out to the cosmos and out to nature. And with you, it's about going in and into your own psyche. And there's that that movement that movement. Um, into the depth and uh, and out to the to the cosmos is like they, they both actually make up they make up the the whole if you like um, but in between there's a lot of there's a lot of many many ways of uh, reaching uh, a place or um, or a language or a feeling and I think feeling is a, is a huge thing actually we haven't talked a lot about feeling but I think feeling and a connection to the universe and that sense of oneness and love and uh, you mentioned being genuine and like you know to be have a uh, integrity and uh, wanting to know want, wanting to know the truth about things and wanting you know uh, uh, questioning things around you um, and I think maybe that is the, the subversive element that the contemporary world doesn't want doesn't want us to question because there's a lot invested in this materialism. There's a lot invested in it, and you know we, you know they, they don't want artists suddenly um, being forced for good because people might stop buying a lot of stuff, you know, because they're happier. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it, again, Scary like you thought. know, uh, I, I don't know where I'm going, but I just want to say that it's it's great, Dean. Thank you. It's great to be here, and it's great to hear yeah. about your work. Um, you know, we haven't mentioned imagination either, and like the role of imagination in the whole thing. But this, it's such a huge. It's such a huge. It's a you know we're just kind of like uh, picking at the at the corner Very or something so, yeah. yeah so um, <laughs> anyway.
<laughs> yeah. I think um, I've been having this conversation for a while now with you, and in fact, I think it's quite important. Like I really picked up on what you just said and on what Carlos said about terminology and definition and labeling. So I'm wondering what, I, like I will, I've always been skeptical of this, of first of all aesthetic, secondly of the movement. So I'm, I'm like, I think it's interesting um, how you left the proposition you left, try to find an extra word to express another state of consciousness, another state of consciousness, ludo consciousness, whatever you were saying. Um, at the same time, I, I, need to, I think we need to acknowledge uh, the fact that we all are pretty pleased about being together and sharing thoughts. Um, so while there is no word, like I think we're all pretty resistant from what I've heard about labeling ourselves into something. So I'm wondering how, like um, I know that like the will for, for D and maybe for some of us would be actually to move forward and maybe be, sorry, a sort of group or collective. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering what do you think about um, trying to find an extra word? Because I was thinking about esotericism. Um, it's a loaded term and it brings some definitions with it. So I uh, wait, let me take take one no. note. Because um, I think I, I'd explain myself here. Um, Okay, so we said two things, that basically all art is uh, esoteric, 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 mm -hmm. all art is esoteric, uh, but also there is such a thing, like, if one wanted to categorize art into things, you could have impressionism and you could have sac sacred art and uh, esoteric art. So if all art is esoteric and uh, such a thing like esoteric art exists, um, I think what do you really want to propose with etheric instead is like this sort of para dominium of of how this word relates to what they mean. <laughs> um, esoteric. Uh, so basically, I think it would be um, etheric would would it be meant to express the basically that all art is, a, is esoteric in a way. So it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be loaded as a term with esotericism and everything that carries. So you're trying to like shake yourself up from that and just Definitely. apply something which is this meaning of something else is going on with this painting or with this performance that I'm seeing or this, photo mark, or this form of art that I am experiencing with, I mean I'm experiencing it at this moment, um, and is etheric because it, there is an invisible domain that happens and I am able to trespass and um, be in touch with the experience However, you know, you can call it Western esotericism, or you can call it Eastern esotericism, or you can call it whatever you want. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you, you do think, um, first of all, etheric art is a, valid, is a valid term whatsoever. And secondly, what do you think about the movement? As well, I was very skeptical about associating with a movement, for what a movement is and everything. So I think I'll pass it on to you and see what happens. Yeah, um, just to say that Benny and I have been talking, I've been talking about the word, to get a word that's not esoteric, because esoteric has problems for me, even more so after I went to the European, <laughs> Western, Western esotericism, Society, something. Right now. Yeah. I have something else to add. Yeah. And in fact, like I don't, like, I don't want to do this, but I'll do it. So, for example, I think it's interesting how etheric really just appealed to some people. Whilst when you did your conference with Translate, there was a true diversity there. I think. Mm -hmm. So I think how maybe that's not the right word neither. So I'm not saying anything here. But I'm just like. I think it's interesting how you really can draw on different interests and different disciplines uh, through what. So whether like there is a there is really scope for us and there to like come up with, with something or maybe you know just to refuse to label in any way what's happening and move forward in a different way, which is which is uh, breadsticks. No, which is <laughs> 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 I definitely have a response to that. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, I definitely have a quote too. Well, it's more important that you speak. It's really? really? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, it's not more important I speak, but I'm a very domineering kind of character, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, can you hear, all right, people? Yes. yes. Um, it, when, when I went to Sway, the founder of Sway defined Western esotericism at the end of the conference to mean rejected knowledge, which deeply puts it in a context of historical uh, discovery of rejected knowledge. So therefore, and he used the analogy effectively of the rubbish bin. So all the rubbish is thrown away, apparent rubbish, which means that you know, we don't discuss um, hermeticism and Christianity together, um, and therefore a, a, a whole, a, 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 a vibrant understanding of Christianity isn't um, developed because we only, we, we cut that stuff away, all the witchcraft, all the, 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 the pillaging of sacred sites to put churches on, all that, you know, loads of that stuff. Um, the deep symbolism in the pillars and the colours and every, everything of churches. And, we, 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 uh, and so Western esotericism is very much about bringing that into the foreground and saying, guys, there's all this knowledge, let's uh, acknowledge it. Um, and, but what I'm, what I'm trying to get at with etheric is, is this um, the actual moment, the, like you're saying, the a beautiful um, um, pronunciation of pure, because I call it aura pure, and you said it's puree. Yeah. Aura puree. I think that's nice. <laughs> I think it's lovely. I don't know why I assumed that. Because <laughs> you're looking at Benny, she's Italian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I immediately thought of a soup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not well. Like when you say well, outer puree, it to... totally make, makes total sense. When you say outer puree, I'm just like, yeah, outer puree. <laughs> puree. <laughs> puree. 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 Um, and so, so what I was trying to do is, is, is get back to something that is, that is actually the experience, but also that, that crosses, that very happily crosses into any organized religion, any, anything that has that, that vibe in it where you feel, you know, you know it's something that's powerful and fascinating. And that's really what I was, what I'm trying, and I've been discussing the word, the word, what to call it for about three years with, with lots of different people. Um, some people got very excited because it's the, Fifth element, ether. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, supposedly. 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 And then other scientific people, genuine, the not genuine, the ordinary scientists get worried about it for exactly the same reason because of the um, controversy over ether. Mm -hmm. And it's something that actually wasn't there. <laughs> it's just scientifically speaking. Scientifically speaking, actually isn't there? Yeah. And so then. Uh, then what's then Benny liked the fact that I'd taken it back into the Greek spelling, therefore trying to to go deeper, you know, to, to, to acknowledge it from an earlier source. Um, originally, I called it a thericism, and then people didn't like the ism because it didn't produce enough flow, which is where I turned it into a movement, and then Benny resisted that because there's only a few of us at the moment, so where's the movement? You know, it's there. And then the idea of, for me personally, the idea of all art being esoteric, I think, could I, would you concur that, that what you, that what you're saying in that is that all art is channeled <coughs> and therefore from that place we arrive at uh, that, that, that process of production and channeling is an esoteric process, so to speak, and therefore, in that respect, all art comes from that, that, that source, as you say, wide, deep, really confusing, 
um, to, 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 to articulate. Um, so that, that's the history of the word, and that's where I've got to. And I'm really, um, I'm really fascinated with the idea of literally just, because as, I, as, as, as more people are starting to come together, I think it's really important because, oh yeah, and I remember having a chat with you about setting up, I'm really keen on setting up a, a Wikipedia type website where all the knowledge that's gathered can be put on this website, and I initially called it Wiki Wiki Etheric, and I mentioned it to you, and you said, "Oh, is that just for your stuff?" And I went, "Oh no!" And immediately went and bought Wiki Esoteric in the hope of then broadening that out. So it's this kind of, and it's not just me because I find that my little patch of Etheric, that everyone's got their own patch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Theosophists have got their patch, and then the SMN, the Scientific and Medical Network, have got their stuff. Then there's the Western Esotericism, and everyone's kind of, a, you know, th these few people are around the same watering hole, um, but but not coming together somehow. Yeah. Oh, dear. Dog in the Have you? <laughs> Listening. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, did, I did want to say something. Um, I'm sure you thought of this, but because I'm, this is the first time I'm talking to everybody, um, I have had done exhibits. And, you know, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of, like, moods from art history, you know, from the past, you know, the Impressionists, you know, have the, the big reveal sort of thing. Um, and this is very different, but, but I mean, have, it, it, it's good for us to all know that we can discuss and, and, and you know, label and, and put all these categories, but what about just having some sort of exhibit that shows the range of what you're calling the Because I think that then shows it's not like what what did you he say to you, oh, is that just for your art, you know? I mean, it shows what a big umbrella this really is. It's not that narrow. That's just one possibility. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that. what I would love to do from this is actually to create an exhibition where we can all put our stuff and, 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 and individuate as, as deeply as we want to and not in any way, there's no compromise to try and kind of squash ourselves into a category at all. Um, like, wait, we're all going to do pointillism now <laughs> or something like that. But so it's not about the, it's because it's not about the physical, that's the whole point. It's not about what you see, it's about the, the, that, the pure, the integrity inside it. And the, that's why it's annoying that uh, our art historian, Mary Atwood, hasn't come on, because she, she was looking at St. Augustine with this concept of tropology, which I've put in, in my book, which is, is, is about that, that experience, the tropos. What is it? Art, art. The, what I use the Trinity, the Holy Trinity? Oh, uh, it's so complicated. I'll give you the book. Okay. <laughs> I just want to jump in and say, um, okay, so uh, I think when we're talking about terminology, we're talking about words, we're talking about categories, okay? Um, <clears throat> and you're sort of saying there that you you know it's uh, you don't want to create something that that that, that it's this uh, necessarily delineated in that way. But by trying to impose a category, and I don't mean that in any kind of negative way, that's mm -hmm. exactly what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. I would suggest is, and I don't mean to mean this in any kind of negative sense, but it's absolutely destined to fail, especially if you're actually talking about the thing that we're trying to be talking about. So I think, like, to put it into concrete terms, like the, you know the book, The Trickster and the Paranormal? Do you know that book, Carlos? 
Okay, so George P. Hansen wrote this amazing book. He's a parapsychologist called yeah. The Trickster and the Paranormal, where he's talking about the very concept of what we're talking about, which he puts under the umbrella of paranormality. But if we take that even broader and, 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 and sort of point out that we're talking about, Carlos very helpfully couched it in Jungian terms in this like um, hero's journey to the unconscious and back again, to the underworld and back again. But essentially it's some kind of ineffable otherness that's beyond language that we can't speak about, right? And it's not an accident that gods of magic uh, are very often gods, scribes, language gods, and, and they're very often tricksters. And, and in The Trickster and the Paranormal, he writes, it's specifically their job to blur and blend categories and to cross boundaries. And that's very much what the trans state's idea was about, it was about embracing this idea that we're dealing with the unlanguageable, we're dealing with paradox, we're dealing with tricksterish. Um, ideas. I think about you, Carlos, and talking about nailing the snake. We're talking about something which cannot be reified. It is not possible. So if you're trying to create a category and you're struggling with it, that could say I mean, two different things. It, you, you could take from that that it's wrong, but you could also take from that that it's right, because I think that that's going to be the case in any given situation when we're talking about the subject matter that we're talking about. I, I think it's completely impossible, in fact. Yeah. Hmm. You guys want to say something? Carlos? We can hear you. We can't hear you, Carlos. So Spanish. No, I love you, I love you, so Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> now we can hear you. Um, <laughs> there are a num number of things to, that I, I, I think. Um, okay, first, uh, if you're it's a nice word in the sense that it permeates everything in the in the traditional sense of the word, right? The, the ether. So um, it is interesting. It's pretty close in a, in a semantic sense to to trans uh, trans states, right? So it's something that transcends a category in itself. My point of view is that if you organize an event like a, a collective exhibition, for instance, something like that would be interesting, very interesting, uh, uh, definitely, to, to see different aspects of um, visions of the different artists. There is a, there is a, in, in a, the, the, of course, a range, a spectrum of, of, uh, of styles, of visions, etc. The thing is, uh, whenever you, you talk about a movement, or as you were saying, the uh, anism in the 21st century, even in the, le the, the late years of the 20th century, of course, after postmodernism, it, it's very r tricky, you know, because it, it fits within the, the, the concept of a grand narrative, and everyone is like pretty much like that, uh, and <laughs> you shouldn't happened. go in that yeah. direction. Uh, That's what happened. I mean, everything is so loaded. Uh, I had that situation with my my own research. You know, the the original name of my of my framework, which was, I, I was forced to give it a name because I needed to refer to it in a way, it was hyper-surrealism. There was an ism and there was surreal. When you talk about surrealism, apart from being a, a, an absolute movement of the beginning of the 20th century, with all the, the things that permeate, um, there was an, an issue, for instance, um, the concept of uh, chauvinism in the early days of some of the members. And of course, if I was using the word surreal, it was loaded with that. So the thing is, in a way, what to, to, to make it brief is you are imposing a vision of reality. So the thing is, you have to be very careful with the grand narratives today. So the thing is, if you just make an exhibition and people want to join, like the trans state concept, it's fantastic. If you want to create a grand narrative, it's very dangerous. That, that's my point of view. Um, I think also the reason why I was proposing whether I mean this challenge of a common word is worth it is exactly for this common exhibition. So if we put all the practices together, what what is it the title? You know what what is it about? I think we just say trans states. Uh, but I, <laughs> no, no, because then no, because then it seems like we're biased. 
which we're not. So no, like we need to find a good way of. But I have I have an issue with trans dates because for me, when I heard about the conference before I met you mm -hmm. and I didn't attend, which is really annoying. Yeah, that was a big mistake. It was a huge mistake. <laughs> it was a huge mistake. I play. <laughs> I um immediately um categorized it in terms of trance. So I didn't hear trans, I heard trance. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. But, in but in the sense of druggy. So I immediately went into the like trans uh, trans folks. Yeah, trans but I mean what? that's part of it. I, 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 I don't want to leave that out of it. So I, I, I purposefully tried to come up with a concept that was as all embracing as, yeah. as I could possibly come up mm. with. Mm. And I purposefully made it a, pl a pun, right? Of relating back to the ludic and play, okay? So there has to be play. And the, and, and the other thing to me was it was really important that trans states had this um, uh, tension within it, that it was paradoxical. Mm. Because it was paradoxical, I know what I think it means, but mm. someone has to bring whatever they think to it, and it gave it. It purposefully tried to give it that that flexibility. Now I never made it. Yeah. Sorry, I never made it thinking that it would be successful. Just like every other creative process, it was just something that kind of came through me. So if it continues to have any kind of movement or momentum, that's fine. And we are putting it on again. But if it doesn't, then you know we'll discard it and we'll play the next game. I mean, I, 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 I'm not desirous to, to necessarily nail it down. It was successful and it gave itself its own momentum to maybe do it again. But if it was just a snapshot in time, then it was just a that's snapshot okay. in time and that's all it was. It was a meeting place in a time and space and that was okay. And it just so happened that and we'll see how the next one goes. The next one might be a complete disaster. Um, but because it had that momentum, I allowed it to. And I think that's the way any movement has to occur. It has to, it has to uh, be grassroots, has to come um, from other sources and, and essentially from beyond you entirely. Because um, like my best artwork, it was literally something that came through me. I wasn't really part of the process at all, really. I just kind of was there trying to make sure that the, the wheels didn't fall off whilst this <laughs> juggernaut of momentum came through, which is what happens in a good artistic process, right? It's this yeah. kind of thing bubbling through. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I don't think there's a problem in um, putting a flag up and, and nailing color to them, but, 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 but obsessing about it continuing doesn't maybe give you enough flexibility. Like Carlos said, in the place we're in now, you really need to be able to dart either way. I wouldn't put my energies into trying to create too much structure, especially in the world of art, where art is shaking up structure, everything that you were talking about, like what art can do in terms of it being a sort of activist mm. and transformative process, mm. is that it's yeah. breaking things down. Yeah, I and wish Holly was here at this point because she's literally doing the complete opposite, isn't she? She's got, you know, an organisation, and she's calling it an organisation, and she's getting board members and chapters, and so it's the reverse of what... Then there's no artistic sort of unifying quality there, it's just yeah. the fact that they are artists. Mm. I think as soon as you ascribe the word movement to something that's happening in the present, it dissolves. Mm. 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 And maybe there's something more powerful in the fact that you can't put a word to this. This is what I mean. Mm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. If you can't nail it down, you're talking about the right thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. That's good. We're talking about the right thing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> From my from my point of view, the concept of uh, guerrilla, it's a, it's a good concept in the, in the 21st century, you know, mm. it's like if you, if you construct Where's something Roy? too solid, you will not be able to move it around, you know, and you have to flow in this century, you know, yes. it's like, yeah. like information. Yes. And it's not even water now, so it's gas, so I think it's, <laughs> it's faster. So, so I think it's maybe, maybe a format if you want to, to, to keep the idea, which is, which is fine, it's fantastic. Like the trans concept, you have an event in 2016, 
2016, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then you have another uh, next year, for instance, and uh, it is there, but uh, it's taking different shapes uh, all the time, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, it, it has uh, many heads, let's yeah. say. Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. Maybe you, you, can, you can organize micro events, uh, or if uh, the concept of poly, you know, it's like a poly, it's like a, you have a, a cell operating in Spain, another in Morocco, another in San Francisco. It's a, a three artists get together and they organize some micro events. Nothing to mention, something that helps to put them together to discuss yeah. things, to share some thoughts, then they separate and they go back to their normal lives, activities, whatever. Yeah? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're so Italian. <laughs> How would that? <laughs> I have a problem. Wait, wait. Carlos, I have a problem. So, I was thinking about I got definitions and stuff. I do agree with everything. Then I was going back to roots and stuff and like seeing where words come from. So I was thinking, perhaps really the one. Those ones that are closest to what we're talking about could be <coughs> geographies. Then I was like, no. Nah. Um, because what we're talking about really is the essence. Here. Hello, sorry, so I was saying, definition. Um, I w probably the ones that go closer to what we're talking about could be geographies in a way. But then I was like, no, let's go back to the root and what we're talking about. So, really, <laughs> what, we're <laughs> what we're talking about is the essence of being, I think and the things around us in a way, like what the is it? The mystery of it all. Yeah, and in a way, if, like, you know, if you just study Greek and know what being is, that's ontos and that's ontology. So I was like, there you go, we're actually <laughs> speaking about ontology, you know what I mean? Like, so, like, again, are we doing something as well? If so we the ontologists then? Yeah, in a way, there is nothing new in what we're doing. Like, people have been paid no. knowledge. There is, there in a way is new. Yeah. There is new. And you want to look forward. You don't want to look. You want to yeah, look at the roots, yeah. but you also want to look forward. You know, at, at the unknown. And I think if you're, if you're looking for, like, roots in words, yeah. you, you're really trying to li limit what it is. You exactly. Know? Yeah, in fact, that's also I was thinking. We're trying to limit here, but. Also, you know, ontology could be like a good linking word to, for me to describe what is it that, for example, I think this is about. Like, it's about what is it in essence. Um, but what the problem is, really, and for example, I don't know why I put it here, but I'm just going to mention it, hoping that I remember. You know the guy that you um, invited for Monad? The guy that he invited for Monad? Um, that was taking lots of LSD and he was a psychiatrist, I think. Oh, yeah. oh David Luke. That way. Yeah. So for example, well, I know it's conjecture that he was taking lots of LSD, but I think it's fair. Yeah, it's no, fair. I think that's how I remember the thing. I was like, he's yeah, a, that's he's a psychedelic thing. researcher. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, psychedelic researcher and also. He said, <laughs> he said, he said, he said. The guy that was taking lots of LSD. Researcher. That's how I remember He needed to go out and research with some students and he took like 20 tabs of LSD with him or 20 mushrooms or no, whatever and then and then his students didn't turn up and he had to take them all himself no, that, 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 that's, <laughs> and do all the research himself no that's no not, that was think. a story no, you, gotta you gotta present him now properly then. I don't think that was anyway. precisely the story no, anyway, you gotta, anyway. So, because I remember that fact and that's how I remember the thing like uh, yeah, I believe it's to, okay. Yeah. Anyways, so uh, the point is, um, you know, like with that thing, with the other professor teaching psychology, I think, in Northampton, that was talking about mindfulness and basically capitalism. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Alistair, the yeah. Zen monk psychologist lecturer. Yeah. The Zen monk. Yes. With um, with Monad, I think I've seen even more interdisciplinary in a way in the in the in the context of methodologies and yeah. background fields. Yeah. So, what I'm wondering, like, what I think is, you know, again, there is no point in finding a definition because, again, if you want to talk about philosophical terms, then you have ontology. If you want to talk about uh, medicine, you would have probably, you know, state of consciousness or psycho whatever or paranormal. Then, then you can go into different. 
kind of mm. um, disciplines like literature, art, medicine, psychology, and they probably attribute different names to probably yeah. the same things, and so that there you go the different understanding. What I think is interesting talking about is, from my philosophical perspective, with the we were talking about um, an exhibition, you know, that could group up stuff mostly for. The thing we had a meeting at the beginning of the year for, yeah, which for me was a very much open event for anything that was a little bit paranormal in a way, yeah, or alternative. But then we we actually then um, had a clash about what kind of aesthetic language we wanted to expose and exhibit. I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, because you know, if we wanted, if the guy taking LSD. That's how I remember, and that's the presentation, sorry. Look. No, he's a yeah, psychedelic Luke. researcher. Yeah. Psychedelic researcher. <laughs> uh, but I, because I've said the first thing, uh, it's so okay, I want to yeah. with it. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what is, um, when, I, when we were planning something like that, for me it was very much about actually reaching out to loads of contemporary artists and not imposing a certain discourse, but bringing them in on the, onto the same boat and having a conversation. So you could be a, fi a filmmaker, or you could be a photographer, a painter, uh, somebody that does illustration, yeah. and not assume any sort of aesthetic language that resembles any sacred art or any esoteric art, because there is such a thing, but still have, um, have the sense of maybe magic, or maybe how you want to call it. So because again, we, we did say art actually is esoteric and is mm -hmm. magic. It's magic in a way, like if, for example, that mm, Alan Moore really inspired me, inspired me in trying to stay, because mm -hmm. I thought that was really that was really what we were talking about with yeah. magic, and that as well how I came to translate uh, translate as well. That's how I saw I always saw magic, not something as too extraordinary, but actually very much present very. in everyday in everyday life. Great. So my question is, how do we <laughs> curatorially engage with sorry? engage with this problem of aesthetic and what kind of uh, visual language we want to adopt because we did have this clash like when I was presenting your stuff you were like but this is not actually showing enough the um, esoteric bit the you know the alternative the um, or what I also call contemporary visionary contemporary visionary so I think as we are all pretty much involved in curating in don't know really in uh, <laughs> there's so many things like whatever you do um, art Thank painting you. and uh, painting illustration pa painting with sign so I'm just thinking you know because you do have these different visual languages how like if it okay let's say we just forget about language and how we call ourselves or we call the exhibition but then can we really include your practice can we you know is it enough contemporary visionary? So who wants to talk? <laughs> I, I have a I have a, a thought about this as as we've been talking. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. okay. Um, and I, I'm going to make a, a parallel here. Again, I hate to keep referring to my age because I don't believe in being old. But you're, you're not you that know, old.
gay are, I mean, it could be more different. You know, understand what I mean? But because it's such a big blanket, it, it gains it, it's gained momentum. It's it's very I mean, it's very in the mainstream now. They're offering PhDs in this, you know, at the universities here and abroad. So I I mean, I don't I don't know how at this point that you have the etheric art movement to the point where it is that you could, I mean, it's not about changing the name, but maybe expanding it in some way. Now, I, I, I can say that, but I can't tell you how to do that, you know. I mean, it's easy for me to say, but in other words, give it a bigger, make it bigger. Because you look at all the different kinds of artists you have already that, you know, would fit into the, the hermetic, uh, you know, and the the spiritual and the transformation, you know. I mean, can you can you sort of expand it? Yeah, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if some combination of terminology like ether states rather than because I think because I think Carlos, you're reacting and you're reacting to the to the word movement and and so you that in a sense I 100% agree. But by the time you just say it, it's like, pfft, it's sort of, yeah, yeah it I literally know. disintegrates yeah. as you, because really... It's not a movement, it's a category, how about it's a movement, it's a category, I, I mean, maybe a better word for category. It's a whole new, it's a whole new thing. Yeah. It's a whole new thing. Yeah. Um, it's a whole new thing. Yeah. And it's a whole new thing. Yeah. And it's a whole new thing. It's a whole new thing. It's a whole new thing. Maybe that's enough. It's a whole new... <coughs> And then there's just yeah. a picture of someone going. Give it a big, bigger frame than a movement. Because a movement, would, would, uh, even the word movement itself means you, you have, you start and there's a destination. This is bigger than that. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> We're all stumped. <laughs> no one's saying anything. Yeah. I mean, even surrealism, you know, it, it was more a category, but it, it, it was very, you know, many artists participated, you know, when were, that was their sensitivity and that's what they did. They went down that road. Mm. I think maybe maybe it goes back to that all art is 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 a channeling of the esoteric, yeah. and therefore, how do we then how do we then describe that? Because it's looked at too narrowly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
brief in a way, mm. you know, and it would be interesting because it moves me from my own uh, comfort zone and at the same time it would make the same with the different other people. I, I think this is the, the idea, that was pretty much trans state, right? So, so yeah. it's, uh, it makes you think in a different way, you share an experience and as you said, you, you think event by event instead of something like this, like it doesn't yeah. weigh for yeah. you also because it's something um, I guess something uh, heavy well, to carry okay. with you, you know, to, to say I, I'm going to, to start a movement, I'm going to start something that will has to live in time. It's like just an exhibition, let's see what happens afterwards, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my, my, my point of view, sorry. Now that it grows organically rather than having that plan, that it has to go step by step. It just can grow into its own whatever it's going to be. Yeah, I, 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 it's fine that you jumped in, Carlos. I was basically going to agree with you. I was thinking about it in terms of the language that you use with regards to your own work and the magic circle and the liminality of that, right? Because uh, a magician's life work, they don't draw the magic circle at the start of their life's work and then leave the magic circle at the end. I mean, they do in one sense, but, but it's, 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 it's grid-like within that, isn't it? It's individual... Uh, workings. Workings is a, an esoteric idea that's kind of very useful in what we're talking about. You bracket it, you create the, the event, the happening, to pull back from the 60s, and you buy into it when you're within that situation, and, uh, and then afterwards, outside, uh, uh, when the circle's sort of uh, uh, uncast again, uh, those are the limits of it. Now, if it leaves a residue, or if it changes, or it has an impact, that's something that it does of, of its own accord. I don't think that setting out to um, to do that is 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 helpful or valuable. I think the the focus, as as Car, Car said, from event to event, from a happening to happening, from working to working, is mm. where mm. is is, is uh, where uh, where uh, one best uh, puts yeah. one energy. Yeah, stick in the present. <clears throat> yeah, um. actually, actually, I just want to mention this, but uh, in this line of guerrilla event style, uh, there was the, in the late nineties uh, the work of Hakim Bay. Regarding yeah, yeah. Time time autonomous, autonomous zones, uh, it, it would pretty work, yeah. pretty much work in the, the concept uh, that we're talking about, I think. I agree. And when you when you listen to the way he explained the thing, is like, sometimes just exchanging events, basically. And something out of time happening there, right? Right. And also, this plain <laughs> word, uh, D, I wanted to point out to you, is very alchemical, you know. You realize, I mean, they, the alchemists would take words and, and you know, find and transform and turn it inside out uh, to, you know, I mean, that was very important part of anything they did, the word play. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we, like you say, Carlos, um, to, to rather just have a uh, a simple word that actually that you that you inject the play into it to show that you know the 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 a I mean I'm just again I'm playing with this but like the a comes with a bracket and then the e comes with a bracket and then there's that f you know then then you're sort of left almost with nothing <laughs> once you once you dissected it all which is exactly what we want it to become. So that so that with a, with some sort of play on you know well, the, messing the around America, you have earth in there you have art in there I mean you you take those is that word you know little bunch of words little bunch of letters you have a lot going on yeah yeah does anyone like that idea of kind of I also almost think, like uh, English no, no, language. The element that unites all the rest, right, in a way. So yeah. uh, it's like the fifth element. So the spirituality is there. Uh, I, I think it's uh, it's inherent. So it's a, uh, of course, spirituality itself. It's a word or, or spiritual. It's a word that uh, like all the rest. Uh, it's it's being emptied of meaning uh, like every day, you know, the moment you, you create a shop of something, it becomes, uh, um, yeah, 
totally empty in a way. So I, I all f- every all, war all, all was all created full. in one way or yeah. the other. Yeah, or or totally full up. Um, like you say, the um, like the word spiritual for me. Is Janet talking? But I, I like I like the word America. It's it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to 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 nail in a way. Uh, so uh, to to commodify in a way. Yeah. Mm. So we like the word etheric. You like, you yeah, there's there's no uh, there's no criticism of the word etheric. Mm. It's a criticism of the expectation of what that, what that becomes. a projection of what that can become. Yes. So yes. I think uh, focusing on small scale, like uh, yeah, an etheric yeah, yeah, yeah. collection or yeah. an etheric uh, event or an etheric show, yeah. and then seeing what happens from that, and don't yeah. and, and, and and allow yourself. It's it's great. It's clever. It's powerful. But if it's going to fly, it will fly. Yeah, like I like board. that. I really like that idea. Actually, yeah, that where 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 you just um, yeah, you have this, just these like you say these autonomous, these spontaneous, and they just. You're 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 literally dealing with people who inherently will find it problematic to label themselves as anything. Yeah, exactly. Right? Is that Me fair? too. Yeah. Right. So there. So straight off yeah. the bat, if you're going, exactly. come and join us and and wear this badge and say you're this. I'm like <laughs> out. I'm out. I'm happy to stand on the outside, yeah. but I'm not. Do you know. To... You know. You know that. I think that's generational as well. Mm, I think it's. My part daughter of... and son are so happy to label themselves up. Um, my daughter actually oh. insisted, insisted that sh- that that she designed merchandise, now called merch, with my painting on the front of a t-shirt, which she loves. I love it. Mm. She loves it. You know what means woman in Welsh? Merch? You know that? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, um, so maybe it's a generational thing. I'm, I'm totally with you though. If, if I said, let's, let's all be a therapist, and you're like, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, can't do it. I can't even do it to myself. It doesn't, it does, it, it's so... I think you're right. It limits, you're and right. that's the, that li- literally the definition of a category is that it's a delineation. It draws boundaries around something. Mm. And magicians don't want boundaries, right? Because they're all encompassing. What you were talking about, Alan, the whole purpose of magic is that it draws everything in. Mm. Not everything that exists, but everything that can yet exist in the future. Mm. It has to remain nimble. Mm. Mm. <coughs> so we so we can offer in a way and just say, have an etheric have an etheric <laughs> of your choice. So my question is, going back to you Callan, let's understand. Whatever it is I do. Yes, whatever it is you do. Also, you know this um, pantomatic exhibition from Trans States that F- he has been to Trans State? Yes, he was speaking at Trans State. I know. And her? No. No, no. no. Jan- so, Janet I met through Emmy Warlick. And Emmy I met at Esway. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know her. Yeah, yeah. You do know her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is she Irish? No, no she's, she's American. American. She's wonderful. Okay. Anyways, do you know her? Yeah. They do, I don't. Yeah. Through oh, okay. <laughs> through Western esotericism. Yes, I, I met her at she... um, Judith's conference. You know this. Well, you know, her field of expertise. I mean, now here's here's a person who started out traditional art history major. And then when she's getting her PhD, you know, her her whole thing was uh, Max Ernst and his uh, collages. That's what her PhD was. And then that's what got her going into alchemy and all of the esoteric stuff with the surrealists. And she is now, she's just retired from the university, but she is considered an absolute expert, not just as an art historian of contemporary art, but of the esoteric alchemy, she's invited. I mean, you know, she was able to combine oh. this, and it didn't matter what she meant. Had a wonderful spoken.
spokeswoman for feminism within Western music terms, as you mm -hmm. that. Mm. Anyway, you had a question? Yeah, anyway, the question was, so you have to know this conference, Trans State, to which some of us went, some others didn't go, uh, was composed by a program of talks, uh, performances in the evening, and uh, an exhibition. Now, the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> the with the spotlight, yeah. <laughs> now, I would like to go back to the question of aesthetic language, because I'm quite concerned with it, because I would like to be a curator. Mm -hmm. So. I know the exhibition has received some criticism, uh, however, I do find that, for example, in that specific exhibition, for example, there was coherence, aesthetic coherence. Okay. Um, then you would, do it, you would have live acts, which were the performances, um, so I'm wondering, like, is there, do you think um, there is a way for us to be really inclusive? Or um, how are we inclusive into the with talking about aesthetic language again? If I were to curate an exhibition with your practices in, what is it that we're talking about? Is sort of visionary or not? Like it's got to be broader because I think, for example, if um, your the exhibition at Trans State was very much coherent, and uh, I think not too uh, in a way. Multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or uh, speaking different aesthetic languages. Okay. In that way. Uh, so I'm just. Sorry, can I just wondering. can I just ask you? When you say it seems like you have a very specific definition of aesthetic language, that I. Uh, yeah. For I'm like, assuming. For what, I re for, uh, what do you mean? Uh, for me, aesthetic language is the. Um, is a group of signs, basically and uh, even techniques that you, that you use to produce um, an artwork slash object. So for example, when um, in, pre, in uh, ancient prehistory, I don't have much vocabulary, so no, no, that's good. Um, you, you would have like, um, peep, like uh, monkeys in between men developing and uh, evolving uh, and making you know, more men than monkeys, men. Um, uh, learning how to use objects in different methods and different minerals and different tools from nature, then they would make the female figure. Right? Yeah, yeah, the goddess. Yeah. That. Yeah. So that, for example, and that for me belongs to a very specific aesthetic language because all the all the aesthetic production from that period. Uh, is quite similar. Then, for example, when you go into um, the Roman Empire, okay. you, you would be able to distinguish the Roman Empire from yeah, the yeah. Greek uh, art instead because it's a different aesthetics. These aesthetics... So, oh, I see. so you mean yeah. a relationality through which you can a material speak a narrative? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like they're basically as a, a, a visual... Yeah, 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 yeah. You see, for me, for me the, the aesthetic language is in what you were discussing is in the feeling yeah the, it's not it's not in the material it's in the feeling yeah but it. it's both it's both and it's both it's a both. little bit no it's definitely both because art's about meaning making and it works on an affective level and it works on a narrative level as well it works on both levels simultaneously but i felt that my henry the third who's there and your cards could sit together yeah, but precisely because for the reason that she's getting that there's a, there's a, either a, a, yeah. a there's a cohesive feeling and a cohesive narrative that has a relation a relationality between those objects. Yeah, but maybe yeah. the first is okay. that the two. That the two okay, two but I have an answer to your question. Go. So I I don't know if I don't know if this is interesting because it's about my conference, but uh, <laughs> I will answer that question. But you were saying about the cohesiveness, huh? Yeah. Okay, so it had its it, 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 it had its criticism. Thank you for your directness. <laughs> <laughs> I had the main criticism go from was from you it, yourself. So I know I'm, I'm, playing, I'm, I'm playing with you. Yeah, you're the trickster. I am. I embody it every minute. I get. Um, it had its criticisms. Some of the criticisms was not within the cohesive nature of the things that were curated within it but with the sharpness with which it was create, uh, curated, so the professionality. Um, now, I think what happened there was because um, I curated it in terms of the selection, and then someone else curated it in terms of the presentation. Uh. And so the person that curated it in terms of the presentation 
had a completely different idea of what it was and what it should be. Also, they weren't remotely invested, either professionally, emotionally, or any other way. They were just doing me a favor. Um, in terms of the cohesiveness, I think that came from one person sort of driving it, okay? And in terms of curating, because I'm not a curator, um, but I am a director, right? So, so, so being a film director, literally my job is that if any person comes up to me and I'm involved in a project, I can immediately make a decision, a kind of knowing about whether or not something is pulling in the direction of the project or not. So if I have a vision, artistically as a director, um, my job is to be a conduit, it's just to be an anchor pulling everything in one direction and to always know whether it's serving that vision or not. I took that and I took that kind of skill set and I put it into trans states and surrounded myself with like expertise and whatever and my job is just to be able to answer questions and go yes this is it or no that's not it. And when the art presented itself that is how I selected the acts and the artwork to go in on the basis of what I had and that's what gave it its cohesiveness I think because I had a vision of a sense of what was a yes or a no and what fitted and what didn't with what my vision of trans states was and then because I'm not a curator, I sort of stepped back from the presentation of those artworks and, 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 and yeah, that became sort of problematic in terms of how it was. So, just to like, give you an idea of what, why I'm asking this. So, for example, what I'm talking about is, did you... Um, yes, we do, probably. Sorry. <laughs> did you, for example, leave out anyway? Did you say no to someone? In oh, the yes, I said no to several people. So, he said it's no to, to people. Now, I said no to people that then other people that from the esoteric art world when you said no yes. to them. Really? I'm really taken. Yes, this happened. This was a thing. So, yeah, okay, but what I'm saying is uh, when I went, in, like, for me, like, the thing I'm talking about is when I was having this discussion with you, I really did uh, propose things that were not related at all with what we're talking about aesthetically. Yeah. So, and but for me, like, I would still make a point that there was a point of relation. So what I'm talking about is, hello? Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, like, I don't know, take, I don't know, Mickey Mouse, like, hmm? Okay, here, listen, okay, so, um, I, this is, this is gonna sound really crazy. I'm thinking of futuristic, but, you know what Kung said about the spiritual, that, that's, very, that's very resonant and it's very generic. But there's something about where the world is here at this point in the 21st century that this sensitivity to the etheric, to the hermetic, is very, very important. So is, could it be that, that your uh, overarching theme is something like um, I don't, you wouldn't use the word futuristic, but it, it's like we're giving you the visionaries. We're giving you the, you know, this is the future, this is the future, but I mean, say it in much more poetic, better words than what I'm using. I just want to give you the meaning. Let's, let's show that, that this is way down there, you know, that, 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 that these, these are artists walking into the future, showing you I think actually when people talk about this stuff even outside this circle and in other cir circles that uh, work similarly and have similar themes then there is a tendency aesthetically like with that exhibition to close up so what I'm really trying to understand is like for what like that's exactly what I'm saying what I'm saying is for me is much bigger and it goes much beyond this uh, visual science that we are yeah. presented with Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, and that's why I wouldn't call it visionary. I wouldn't call it esoteric. I wouldn't call it esoteric. I would call it. I, I see that film and makes me think of this, this, and that. Therefore, um, I don't want to Im uh, imply or force a certain discourse on something. But I would like to have an honest uh, conversation with the person that made the film to understand whether there is a ground 
or a, a, a common ground there. Well, you know, because sometimes people do make stuff. I do think, mm. with my perception, given my experience and background, that there are so meanings. And then I talk to people, and they're like, "Not really. It was about feminism, and uh, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're completely wrong. Yeah. Like, I don't have any idea you're talking about." Yeah, just like fine. Yeah. But that doesn't have to be even that, that open because that otherwise, I think, I think you brought up a really interesting point because um, I, I've been having this tangle because there are so many people, like you were saying, uh, Chloe, about the tarot, and um, and also I noticed Jeff Coons just has. <laughs> See her face? Oh, thank you. Thank you. fun. That's it. <laughs> um, that Jeff Coons just produced something uh, that he called the ethereal. Um, you know, so, he, so there is this sort of, like you say, a bandwagon that people are jumping onto. But when Dalit wrote to me and, and, and described her herself it was I knew instantly that it was that we were in communication in the same language mm -hmm. um, so maybe maybe that's what it will take it will it would take an actual just a conversation with somebody to know yeah well, there is that yeah. Not. yeah and maybe over time as each pop-up event happens um, that we will be able to, it to is describe really about it. It's really people, not about the name. It is really about people and about making that connection with particular people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this thing potentially and having the, yeah. a, a future and a life and a movement, but you don't have to call it that. Yeah, it's not about the name. It's about the actual reality of yeah. things happening. Yeah. yeah. And the, um, it's like, and also perhaps people's responsiveness. So you recommended um, Black Mirror, the Black Mirror group, to me. Uh, I mentioned them. To you mentioned you. them, yeah. Yeah. Da is it David Shepherd? Uh, Darren Shepherd. Darren Shepherd, and um, he's quite the artist. I quite like. Yeah. Him. I like yeah. Him yeah him. No, I really, mm -hmm. I really kind of um, it was enjoy, you know, really kind of getting interested in, in what they're doing, but um, he's very awkward to. You know, collaborate with at all. I wanted to get him here, um, but he. Yeah, but this is okay. So this is the thing about having a collective of individuals, and when you have people that are kind of yeah, hyper individual, yeah. it's not always easy to bring people together. In fact, the bringing of things together, right? That which you come back full circle to. That is the magic, right? And and not every person's going to be drawn to to everything, you know? So just because he sure. has interests in those areas doesn't mean he's going to want to immediately leap to an event. And it doesn't mean that he won't want to come to the next one. Um, so, uh, yeah. you know, I think it, it's, it's uh, not necessarily, um, putting on any kind of events, right? To, 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 to go out of the sublime and go into the mundane for a while, I've been yeah. putting on events my whole life in terms of like music and things like that. And uh, uh, knowing what is the thing that's going to pull everybody in, you know, that factor X is not something that you can know before you, before you put the thing together, right? No, you can't so, um, uh, and, and, and neither should you, because if you know beforehand, then that's like an egoic kind of uh, 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 domination, you know, when what we're, what we've been talking about sort of on these artistic processes. And there's an art in doing that. Like, there's an art to all of these other things. Um, the, you know, a real artistic process is, is kind of a, an impersonal kind of creative process that happens through a person. Whether we couch it in terms of the unconscious or a daemon or a genius or inspiration or whatever other words we want to use to kind of sidestep the idea that it's being imposed by a, a kind of a egoic kind of a certainty that you can structure it and know that it will happen, right? You can't know that it'll happen. You need the chance. You need the randomness. You need the, the, the factor X whatever that is mm. Yeah. Mm. and you just keep rolling the dice until, until you get snake eyes yeah. <laughs> I think snake eyes yeah so what it, okay now um, I, I, I have, this might sound like really weird suggestions this is to you who want to you know, I didn't hear your name. Me? Who are you? Benny. Belly? 
Then B E double N Y. Oh, okay. You know, uh, in terms of um, maybe you could put the cup before pops. In other words, you know how when you're creating art, you uh, most of the time you know where you're going and going. This is going to happen. And maybe when you start looking at the art that you would want. Luckily enough, I got the sure. sensibility. Uh, but then what I'm thinking about really is having this discussion and then having actually uh, like a shared sensibility uh, thematically, but then a very different conception of what the visual experience is. And so what, you know, yeah. is it, are we talking about a Monet or are we talking about a Mondrian or can we put the two together? That was, that was the point, like if it was for me, I would happily like mix things up Yeah. and, uh, and um, juxtapose things that like visually don't make sense but then again if you look inside them there is a, com there is a background thread that actually links things, these things up so it doesn't really matter the practice or the medium you use mm. but if it's this that we're talking about then we can put it together yeah. but then I was actually having this conversation and you know I was, I was um, argumented against that actually we should instead find a, co a cohesive okay, practice right. and visual language yeah so and and that's and then i'm wondering you know when i saw translate that w that that happened so i'm wondering if yeah. if we're going towards working together can i put your practices together or we like if something doesn't look like this then must be you know banned yeah. Okay. So, so this is immediately making me think of uh, you, Carlo, and uh, things that we're very interested in generally. You're, it's immediately you say juxtaposition. You say things that aren't cohesive, as in they don't have this uh, easy flowing explanational narrative. So it seems to me that it's like taking the cut up process and applying it to curation. And I think that, uh, you know, if you take narrative, you take uh, linearity and how that is easy for people and they welcome that. Um, many other different art forms that you're working with that you may curate have chosen to jettison that and have non-linearity and to cut up and to juxtapose, you know, juxtaposition to, um, to uh, yank people out of that. And, and I think absolutely it's complete insanity for artists to be doing that in the art world and for curators not to be able to engage in the same process. I think if you do engage with that process that you're going to find people that are going to react negatively um, uh, to what you're doing, but I also think that's probably a good thing. But then. We, but it is because I tell my students all the time if people aren't reacting to your work, if it's yeah. bland, then what the hell are you doing? Why bother, right? If they hate it, at least you're having an effect on them. At least it's having an impact. Uh, and if, if, if some people hate it, other people will adore it. And uh, uh, so, yeah, so it, it, if that's kind of what you're saying, then um, yeah, I would absolutely agree. And then in terms of what's pulling it together, uh, an intuitive sense of, of yeah, yeah, intuition. Intuition, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you very much taught me that actually from Translate. Um, there, there is, uh, there should be even that side criteria, but uh, there should be one at least because um, I remember I visited an exhibition in uh, Northampton's uh, Jew Museum. Sorry, no, it was in the yeah, it was in the art gallery, um, the, the, the art museum of Northampton, and it was 
curated like that. It was a selection of all the objects they had, and it was like a, a butterfly collection next to a huge gold shoe and these kind of things. And it was like living a surrealist or or Dadaist experience. And it was great. But the thing is, even in, in such a, a chaotic uh, collection of, of, of pieces. Uh, there is a criteria of, uh, of, of chaos, of uh, disorder, or whatever. Okay. Uh, I think, in a way, whenever you invite people to to bring their material to or to want to join, you have to offer at least a title and a brief description of what it's going to involve. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, it would be fantastic. It's like we invite you to something you don't know. Uh, you will never That's know what to do. But uh, I mean, usually you will probably go with, with the other direction. But uh, I, I, I will be open to anything, uh, just to let you know. Yeah, but but Carlos, that that well, speaking for myself, the game is to make people think that you're you're creating a particular umbrella that they should. But actually, it's that that they read their own thing into it, whether you meant that or not. Like this is the game I try to play uh, to keep it open. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, it's like, in a way, what we're saying here is like, let's define a, a direction, but it could be playful, it would be yeah. mad, it would be anything, but yeah. the thing is, define it in a way, right? Uh, that's why why I said before that uh, the word, uh, it's there, it, it's interesting, because first, it's not used. Uh, I don't think there is uh, something like you have fantastic no. art, you have visionary art, you have surrealism, etc. But you don't, you don't have ethereal, so that's interesting, and it's a, it's a, a wide umbrella that is very close. Again, uh, I don't want to insist, but to spirituality, which is one of the aspects of magic as well, esotericism, etc. So instead of using those words directly, if you don't want to use them, of course, but uh, um, it, it is an interesting concept, and it's new. That's uh, that's uh, that's valuable, I think. Yeah, I should also but try. Yeah. I should also throw and, and in and mention. There's also the word sacred. I mean, you know, you can think about that as well because that the esoterica, I mean, there's a lot about the sacred going on with that. Anyway, just a thought. I should I should also the mention. Of sacred is it's also involved in uh, when you talk about esotericism is like the difference between esoteric and exoteric is uh, the difference between the profane and the sacred and in the art is again we, we will go back to this, the previous issue but uh, is that you experience that sacred moment of uh, connection with yourself whatever you want to call it with the spiritual with, with, with God with the universe with, with the, the archetypes anything but the thing is we are we are pretty close the thing is if you say something directly it is different if you, if you use a general umbrella that can be interpreted in different ways uh, i will go back to the concept of trans states it's, of course it involves the word trans because it's a, like a, a sort of fun but the thing is you have transformation you have transsexuality you have uh, you have a number of things and it was fantastic and it, even, but that's, uh, I, I'm not sure if that was your idea, Kevin. Yes, it was. The concept of the T and the S was, was fantastic. Uh, yeah, I no. think it, it came up to it. The, 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 the t well, no, no, but the T and the, the, t and the S was probably more, uh, I, I think, profound than, than, than the name. The T and the S was actually something I designed previously for something else. What was it? Was it the Well, it was just because it was called trans states, and then I did a T and an S as the cross, and then the serpent on the cross. Ah, uh, brilliant. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, you create. Uh, this, this is something. I mean, um, yeah. this is something to keep in mind because, as I say, if you have something that is related to the ineffable, like uh, etheric, that's a good word because it's very difficult to nail it. Yeah. And then if you do like he did, like you add meanings over meanings. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot more difficult to, uh, yeah, to, to commercialize the word in a way to to, to commodify it. You know. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that that's something to keep in mind. I'm not I'm Definitely. not giving a precise answer, but conceptually it's something to keep in mind. I think.
Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, the other, the other thing I want to mention, which I haven't mentioned at all, actually, is that um, the, the, the change from a thericism to a theric came from a symposium that I ran about a year ago with um, a group of very bright academics. And um, one of the things that came up was because I, because I got very involved with scientists, like you, Janet, because of this exploration, because, because of scientism and, this, and, the, and this, 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 um, the way science actually has dominated our concepts of space and time. And yeah. Yeah. And there's a, a scientist that I'm very, very close to who I would love to introduce you all to and him to you. Um, he's called Alan Rayner, Dr. Alan Rayner, and he uh, has developed this concept of natural inclusion, which um, I won't go into it, but, but, but in brief, that we, we are part of space and space is part of us which seems completely obvious, but in the scientific world, it doesn't work like that. We are distinct from. And in collaboration, he wanted to use the word from a science perspective of ethericity, which works as well. So, so there is actually NI, which is his concept, natural inclusion, ethericity, that we're... That, 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 that is also in play, which is quite fun. Um, and I said, I don't think I can get my teeth around it <laughs> because you've got the word city in it. But he said, that's good. Who cares? So there is, so there is also that kind of going on, which is, which is lovely. Um, I think if we want to talk about the very simple mechanics, mm. I think when we first talked to uh, uh, S-Way, you were talking about the shift. Well, like it, I was going to call it esoteric, uh, sorry, etherism, and then I moved. I think etheric art is right. Yeah. Ethericity has that kind of. That's that kind of thing that we as academics do. That's not going to be in any way popular parlance, and it's not, <laughs> not, not the kind of thing that flows easily. And actually, how something is to say is a big part of the way. Really? It's really yeah, absolutely. That's why all culture is so popular because it's another pun, and it's really nice to say. Mm. Um, mm. And you can mm. make additional puns like a cultural appropriation and stuff like ah. that. Um, but yes. I, I, I think I think etheric works. I think um, I think Carlos is right. I think you know just uh, <laughs> allow it to be playful. ambiguous. Allow it to be playful. Keep building up meaning on meaning on possibility, and, and you know, and and see, and then throw it off, and don't get too obsessed with trying to pin it down, um, and just 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 maybe celebrate that you have come onto something that is a new term, uh, which therefore is useful because new is always great, right? New creates possibility, and, yeah. and and play with it and see what becomes yeah. of it, and, yeah. and, 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 and that we can do that, that we, that we can all share in this play, um, yeah. Sounds excellent. Does that cope with your curating vision? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Benny's happy. No? Yeah. I'm also eating, which is also <laughs> might, might be part of the cause, you know, like, when I'm starving, I, I go for it, whatever it is, like, I become a Nazi, but then you put Yeah, no, no, no. Um, again, like because it's not just this, like visionary art, whatever. Like it does look all the same. So I'm wondering, like, is it that like to be esoteric, you oh, or to be esoteric, well, esoteric, you need to be part of a um, very specific way of expressing yourself? You know, like, you know, we do, we do now think back about people like Van Gogh. You would say, I don't know, is expressionist or is um, impressionist, or you could, you know, you could name it. And so I'm like, but he refused, he refused himself, like all the, like, you name one person that someone just went to them and said, oh, you are really, you know, your art is very <laughs> romantic, or you belong to the Renaissance, and they went, oh, yeah, yeah, that's his, oh, this is very Baroque, like, it never happened, like, yeah. retrospectively, we look at this stuff, and we group up people together. Agreed. But it does seem that, like, currently, ah, 
It does seem that currently people tend to group up themselves into sorts of movements and things. So I'm like, is this that we're trying to do? And, and then, can we please keep it open to anybody else that want to jump on? Yeah. That, that, was, that was the whole thing. Like, mm -hmm. please do not see this as an aesthetic language that we need to adhere to, mm -hmm. but actually mm -hmm. just something that, is, that someone is doing and then there is so much more possibility. Like, can we put this exhibition with Florence, Florence Big performing in it? For me, it's a massive yes. Mm -hmm. However, you know, I do find resistance in this. But th this is what I was, this is what Roy and I were trying to do with the sort of next step with Monad, which was trying yep. to open it up even more. And you do see... You and and the whole idea of Monad issues. was it was a Unitarian kind of uh, idea. And so this moved it outside of art into the realm of politics and into mm, the realm yeah, of, mm. of, 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 of science, because that's what the, 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 the parapsychology was and such like. But, the, the, but, you know, but this was done by having the, as Carlos said, like the core being the broadest core that we possibly could. And it was an ontology because it was about being change. Mm -hmm. That's what it was about, you know, this was the ontology. Fact, yeah, so like when I was thinking about what it did, they were talking about it's actually many, many things. Like you could start with theology and then spiritualism and then ontology and then even phenomenology because it's really about change. And, and there is a movement in here as well. So it's not just the essence of being in a certain state to define, but it's in continued um, either development or evolution. Yeah, and this links precisely to what Alan was saying in his talk. Precisely to what he was saying. That was magic. Oh, I think I never shared it with you. No. I will <laughs> right <laughs> now and then we go off and just enjoy the magic of it. I can't find them. Uh. So yeah, that, 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 was, that is my problem because in the self trans state, the exhibition was much, it seemed much more curated aesthetically so that like people just cohesively stay together. So I was like, if that's how it's going to be like, I'm not part of it because for me it's much broader. It's much broader, like, I, I do like, yeah, for me, modern exhibition is more what easy. I would like to do. Translate exhibition was too narrow, it's, it, with the aesthetic language that he was using, it was too, ra was too narrow for me. Cool. So, um, but this is also about what we're talking about being nimble, right? Mm. So, so trans states uh, tackles it from one area. Yeah. What Monad actually, so uh, Monad is like a, another movement and a journal that I'm involved in. And what it grew out of is, because I did trans states because the art magic connection thing and you know, I was very interested and I was like, I want to bring together actual magicians and practitioners mm. and actual artists and academics mm. and create that meeting place between all those people but it was still esotericism and art right and mm. spirituality and it was quite uh, that's not at all narrow mm. but 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 with monad roy and i you know we really uh, a colleague of mine he he pulled together he was uh, amazingly helpful and he was this um uh, amazing anarcho punk from uh, the whole anarcho punk scene and we bonded really strongly and I was like, you know, that's really interesting because my roots were a narco punk. And, uh, and then he invited me to speak at the Punk Scholars Network and I went and I was like, okay, so I don't do punk scholarship. I was a punk. <laughs> now I do Western esotericism. What the hell am I going to talk about? And then uh, Marco did this like reflective piece. He was one of our keynotes and he like self-reflected on his life. And I was like, right, I'm gonna, because you're not supposed to do that in academia, right? It's don't do self-reflection. And I was like, right, cool. <laughs> I'm gonna do that because he did it. So I'm gonna do it. And I was like, right. so I literally sat down. And I was like, how have I, how's that come together? Um, and then all of a sudden, oh, the connections just start flying. And I was like, this is about a praxis. This is about a transformative praxis. This is about, mm -hmm. this is about bringing about change, bringing about novelty, bringing about, uh, and that's why the two things were linked. And as oh. soon as I drew that link, and this is kind of what I'm all writing into my PhD work now, that link is there, right? The revolutionary, the, the social agitation that's in what's going on now with, the revival of the link between esotericism and activism, both mm. on both on the left and the right, mm. yeah, like the rise of the witch movement out of second wave feminism and mm -hmm. all of the occultists that are like really engaging in political life, because it's because they are interrelated, mm. directly interrelated. And hence, and hence, a lot of the conversation here about um, changing the world. 
from from the Americans. Because this is what it's about, yeah. I know, I had a bit of like, to that. I don't know if you that but yeah like you say well i so change it is, it is, it is so, there is an activism so instead of changing the world in terms of trying to change other people i think it's about taking the uh the, the locus of control within and mm. and i think where 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 esotericism and sort of magical practice and like radical anarchism and and and, and that sort of um anarcho-punk thing crossover is it's about um uh, a, a real radical turn to the self. It's about taking a radical responsibility for yourself and for yourself and how you express yourself into the world. So in terms of magic, that's very much about expressing yourself into the world. In terms of like art, that's very much about the sort of becoming it. I know we're talking from an inside out kind of thing. That's the failure of language. But politically, it's the same thing as well. It's about taking that radical responsibility. Um, for, for, for yourself and yeah so so as soon as we hit that I was like oh no wait this this actually goes over into every conceivable field if we just focus it on transformative practice on being change on the ontology of um, of, of, of people who are neophiles instead of being frightened of change and obsessed with structures of hegemony and existing hierarchies people that welcome new things into the world and willing to like birth and create new things. And in fact whilst mm -hmm. the modern for example which is where itself a very a, a too broad structure, like um is where you, I think it would be quite difficult to find it was welcoming as an environment because you could see the different practices and it was beautiful. But for me it was even more striking to be a trans state with what I was talking about because the exhibition I brought in didn't have anything to do with any of the the art that was presented, yeah. neither thematically, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so for me, that but that was inclusive and I found lots of responses and in fact people wanted to talk to, to me afterwards and I was like, um, we, you know, you need to understand that we need to be on the same level because we uh, academically slash in theory everything coincides but then the type of art you are talking about perhaps I'm not really able to engage with fully because I'm not an expert in esotericism anyway. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that was the gap there. But at the same time, I did. there was a sensibility, there was an intuition that was shared and that was beautiful. Mm. So I, I really liked that. Like, again, if you're thinking about doing translate again, I really liked the element of it was very cohesive and every now and then there would be these things popping up like, what is that doing there? Mm. But then there was a link. Once you win one and it yeah. was just very so good. It, so it this transformed is, so the concept of conference as well, didn't it? Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm writing up the, uh, oh, I, uh, just between you folks, so I'm writing up the introduction for the book, which, which is going to come out in the first quarter of 2019, and it's definitely running again in 2019. So do we edit this out of the video? Yes. <laughs> also the bit where I kind of maybe consult with my colleague a little bit, you can take that out too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but a, a, a conference as a convocation, this is something that I want to talk about, like that as a magical process. And that's very much how I see myself and, 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 and the, the, uh, my obsession with the idea of a crossroads and meeting places and bringing things together. Um, there is room for uh, refining things down and narrowing them and getting into the fine detail but what trans states was about and all the things that i like to do is very much about finding those unexpected links between things which might not immediately obviously have a connection mm. right those kind of non-linear lateral kind of connections and that you go oh wait you know, you know so, so that that's what i'm deeply fascinated mm. by mm. um so so bringing together unexpected things unexpected people and then having like you say, that precise reaction of going, I had no idea that we would have this running through it, but actually that's there. Mm. Um, that's, that's, that's what I'm kind of obsessed with. I literally don't know how to do anything other than interdisciplinary. <laughs> it's all I've got, that's my thing. <laughs> Fantastic. What I want to do is, because I think these guys are mm. dying slowly, yeah. um, <laughs> is kind of wrap it up a bit and we've lost the connection with um, Carlos and Janet completely. I think it's to do with, um, um, I can't pronounce her name properly, Tonya. 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 
going and therefore I think probably the thing just shut down at her end which shut us down um, is sort of wrap it up in um, a few words so maybe we could each do a little kind of final I am terrible at summaries <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do it like that. I'm a terrible summariser. <laughs> and just do whatever you fancy to kind of as a as a goodbye. What am I gonna... starting? Yeah, you are. Oh. <laughs> just because you were there. No pressure. Mm. <laughs> okay. I think what's emerged is that whatever we're trying to get at is totally ineffable. And maybe that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> maybe we should just follow instincts, follow aesthetics, see what links arise organically, and you know because that's maybe where the power of the etheric lies. It's, it's the organic formation of ideas, which perhaps are you know multi-layered and totally various in perspective. Um, and therefore, it must put a classifier. Mm. 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 Evade taxonomy, yeah. which, which is exactly what you need. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my summary. Mm. Mm. I'm not very good at summaries, she said before, perfectly summary. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, I think that was it, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure there's anything to add. <laughs> Seriously, that was about it, really, wasn't it? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to say is that are you based in Swansea? I'm based, yeah, I work in Swansea. Mm. So the next thing to add is please invite us to see your work in Swansea. Okay, well, you know, you have an open invitation, and uh, I hope to keep in touch with you guys. You know, it's been yeah. amazing to meet you all, and it's been really interesting, and I think really well done, Beat. I mean, you know, like just the the sheer spirit of doing this is amazing you know um really you know uh, you know it's it's great you know um and you know the word you know i can have like my misgivings or you know but you know it worked on me i look i looked into it when i saw it I thought, oh what's this um you know and, and we and we did connect yeah and you know the yeah, you know, and I'm totally with what you said, you know, as, uh, as Kevin said, you know, like, you know, it's um, totally, it's like, you know, like, the, it's the organic evolution of this yeah. whole, you yeah. know, thing. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you all, uh, you have an open invite to come over, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah, just I uh, was saying, if you can share that with this context, that would yeah. be yeah. Absolutely, I already did that. Maybe you didn't notice in the um, in the email. Oh, with the agenda, is it? Yeah, all in there? so the agenda. Oh. So I already I I was constantly kind of putting so that if you know if you've got that kind of minute in time where you go, who else is going? Oh, oh. it was for that kind of, but. I'm like you guys, I don't really notice until I'm like one minute before I arrive. Like, oh, I oh am. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering whether there was a, like, in, because in the agenda you can't really find websites and stuff. There is your bio. Yeah, and there's like, no websites, yeah. Yeah, so, or pictures, like, even with the lady that does sun stuff. Yeah. I really wanted to see the stuff she was talking about because she it followed a little bit the yeah. process, but also got lost into the process. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I would rather see it and be like, ah, this is how yeah. it works. Yeah, well she literally uses light, I mean, from the sun, and creates images, uh, what she calls them, sculpture, light sculpture, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they are what they are, they're, they're incredible and beautiful and they photograph quite well, probably nothing like as good as actually experiencing that diffusion and interference that she was talking about. Um, She's she's actually very modest. She's done incredibly she's well. Lovely. Yeah. She's fantastic. Um, it seems to perf like beautifully fit in thematically into the idea of a Beric to me. What she's talking about. Yeah, and she loves that concept as well, which is like 
Yeah. Well, I, I, and Carlos does, and, and, yeah. and, 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 yeah, and, and when we've talked about it, and I've been like, uh, when you were couching it in terms of like, I'm trying to create this movement collective that I want people to, you know, jump into my gang, when, if there was any sense of me going, okay, well, that's your thing and it can be over there, isn't me going, I therefore think it's a bad thing that I don't want to be a part of, no, because no, no, I took, that's I demonstrably it. not true because I'm here. Exactly. And all of the things that we were talking about. No, I, I took, no I took it in the, in, in the intention that you, I, I picked it up, mm. that your, your, um, Nonsense. reaction, if you like, oh, okay. is not just, I don't take it as just you, I take it as, as that's like a voice, you know, like a sound, to say, <laughs> to say, notice this, okay. this isn't, this, this is, this is, you know, causing a, that sticky, kind of uncomfortable, like you're saying, it's, it's quite a lot of those kinds of things going on that you just, like I have the reaction to the word psychic and soul and spiritual, yeah. which is why I wanted another bloody word. Yeah, um, but this is what we were saying, right? So reaction. it's ineffable, right? Yeah, so it's ineffable. the reaction to the words is not the same as the reaction to yeah. this underlying thing that yes. even though none of us yes. can talk about it, we all know <laughs> enough or understand enough about it and each other to yes. recognize that yes. we're all talking about yes. the same thing. Yes, yes, yes. And that and should be, in, in a way, the, the next night. conversation is to talk about our ineffable experiences. To talk about yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I see this kind of artwork um, and the kind of artwork I'm involved in and the other kind of artwork that I'm interested in as um, a, a, an outwelling, an outpouring of this attempt to try and express this kind of inexpressible thing. So you kind of have the experience and the, the, the knowledge of it, and then you can do now, but try and it's a, it's a revelatory process, right? You yes. talked about yes. uh, uh, alternative modes of knowledge production. It's absolutely that. It's this kind of birthing of something, uh, and, and that's yeah. And, and, and it's going to come through the lens of every unique person, and therefore be unique and different in its definitely, expression. Definitely, definitely. Well, I think everyone has summarized beautifully. <laughs> Thank you to you guys so much, Michael and Jill. And uh, uh, fantastic, really amazing, yeah. and uh, it won't be the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect.